This is Watkins. Welcome with Bridget Fetessy. I'm Bridget Fetessy, and you are welcome. <laughs> <laughs> You know the drill. Please subscribe, rate, comment, share, reach out, tell your friends, send smoke signals, whatever. We love your feedback and we want to hear from you. Are you looking for excitement in your life? Are you looking to make a change? Do you want to move to a new city? Do you want to find new friends? Do you want to be the best version of yourself? I'm Lexi and this is my Diary of a Gen Z podcast. I spend half my life on the ground, the other half in the clouds. This coming of age podcast will answer your real life questions, but explore your daydreams too. Check out at Lexi every week on podcast one. What's better than courtside seats? Free sports on Pluto TV. Hey, sports fans, get all your sports free on Pluto TV. Pluto TV is your home for sports. Watch 24 seven channels of MLB, MLS, MMA, sports news and analysis, plus documentaries, TV shows and movies all for free. No signups, no fees, no contracts ever. Download the free Pluto TV app on any device. Our guest this week is author of memoir Chaos Monkeys, formerly at Facebook and notoriously and briefly at Apple, and currently writing at thepullrequest.com. Antonio Garcia Martinez. Antonio is a brilliant mind. I love his perspective on all things tech. This podcast can get a little bit meta because this happens to be his wheelhouse talking about media, thinking about media and tech in general. It's fascinating. I could talk about this stuff all day. I'm with Antonio Garcia Martinez, everyone. Welcome. Thank you, Bridget. Thanks for having me. It's, I feel it's overdue. <laughs> I I know I know I, we've met before we've chatted yeah. in the same house I, somehow a podcast didn't happen and yeah I, I don't even know if I had a podcast at that point or it might have just been I think very, you, ju you just started it, no I yeah I still was just a newbie in the podcast space although I still feel like a newbie in the podcast space so I was gonna ask just a random question because I love starting things off with random questions okay and I'll, I'll tell my story first. Okay. What is something you've done lately that you've felt ashamed about? Ashamed about? Mine is really shallow, but I ended up talking to my therapist about it for like an hour today. <laughs> uh, I mean, other than getting fired by Apple and becoming the tech media story for a week <laughs> or more. Yeah, you were the internet, what do they call it? Like the person of the week or whatever? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the, the title you don't want. Were you <laughs> ashamed of that though? No, actually no, not really. Yeah, I don't think that's anything that you should be ashamed of. That feels like something that happened to you, not necessarily that you that you did. Uh, fitting justice or just randomness in the universe, who's to say? But, yeah. yeah, I guess it depends on which, uh, like, where you're coming from. Some yeah. people would feel like it's the it's karma or something. Yeah. <laughs> I still don't really fully understand what happened. Can you explain to the people listening? <sighs> Are you allowed to? Uh, no. Okay, um, so they can Google it. Yeah, what's in the public record is obviously in the public record. Right. And so, um, you know, I, that's pretty easy to find. Okay. Yeah. So Google it, guys. Sorry. You know, you have computers. Something happened, and now, what, are you on a sabbatical? <laughs> uh, I Yes. I. This is like the post-cancellation purgatory, I guess. Uh... I'm just, it's limbo. It's limbo. So do you consider what happened to, to you to be getting canceled? You know, I asked myself the question, in, in theory, presumably, I mean, certainly from large public company employment, right? <laughs> probably, but um, more generally, no. Um, right. I think, I mean, my read on it, obviously it's somewhat biased, is that the media story was somewhat in my favor, um, if not mostly in my favor. And so, I, you know, and then I had thousands of missives from well-known people to just, you know, random people who were supportive. Right. I literally couldn't get through it all. So I, I, I know some of you I didn't get back to you. I'm sorry, but it was just too much. Um, so, you know, it it was weird. When it was going down, just my personal experience, and not talking about the corporate side at all, there was this, I, I don't understand why, but there was this weird, I mean, if I was more religious than I am, although we can get into that, or if I was more Christian than I am, I would say that there was some feeling of grace, right? Feeling 
touched by some sort of serenity or tranquility about mm -hmm. it. That normally I'm a, I'm a hot mess and I would literally have been the most anxious wreck and taken it out in various dysfunctional ways. That, that, that absolutely did not happen at all. Interesting. And it was just this bizarre feeling of calm while the world exploded. <laughs> and I really can't explain it. Huh. That's really fascinating. Yeah. I mean, that's a lot of what this podcast is about, is overcoming, res you know, resilience, grit, overcoming hardship and how you respond to hardship. And it's interesting that you, that would happen to you when, as you kind of mentioned, your world exploded. Because you had moved... Yeah, right. I mean, there's yeah, that's that's in the public record. Yeah. I, um, you know, I was based in the northwest on this little island in the northwest for it a while. It looked gorgeous. It's, it's a it's still a gorgeous place, Orcas Island. I built sort of a compound there. Um, I planned on spending years here, having my kids had been there and stuff. And then I sold it. I mean, it literally the deal, the transaction closed the day that this all went down. And so I was moving from most of my life from the northwest um, to back to the Bay Area when it happened. And so it was just bizarre juggling this massive PR situation with. <laughs> Like, I literally had my Jeep full of stuff parked on the street in Seattle for like two weeks. And I didn't wow. know what to do. I was like, do I ship it down? I can't spend two days driving it. Um, I, it's, I won't, I, you know, I won't bore your listeners with like the planes, trains, and automobiles that was involved. But I, I had to fly up there a couple times. I had to pay people to ship stuff. It was just a disaster. Wow. Because my, you know, you're moving your entire life and then you hit like eject in the middle of it. Right, right. And um, it was a very strange situation to go through. But, you know, I think I've landed in a nice place. You know, it's, um, Again, that, that feeling of grace or tranquility about it has never really left. I, I didn't have like a panic attack two weeks later when I realized what happened. Yeah. Um, so, so far, so good. I mean, it, you know, in the scheme of things, not as a plug, but partially as a plug. Um, you know, I, I relaunched my sub, my Substack for real this time. Oh, good. Um, yeah, the people at Substack were very kind and, you know, helped me out and, and convinced me to get, to take it seriously. Um, the founders are great people. Yeah. And um, they, they had been nagging me to take it seriously for a long time. And they, they're finally, um, I don't know if this is actually true, but I suspect they're like, ah, oh, we finally got him where, where we want him. He can't go back to tech. <laughs> <laughs> Hit him with the offer now. He's going to accept for sure. Okay. And, and they did. I mean, they're great guys. They're super They're super on the ball, too. So, yeah. So, I, I restarted the Substack in a serious way. That's my full-time job now, which I've just accepted. I think, I know you, you talk about issues often on this podcast about, you know, and, and your own history with addictions. But, you know, my own personal history, I mean, some, some of your listeners might have been readers. I published this book, Chaos Monkeys, in 2016 that... Did very well, bestseller list for a month, you know, book of the year, NPR, Wired, all these mainstream outlets, which is funny that now you reread passages and it's considered, you know, the most abusive thing in the history of the world. <laughs> but, um, but in any case, um, that book came out and then, you know, I became kind of a full-time writer, person living in like the spectacle, as they call it, capital P, capital S, which I mean, you do as well right here. In this world, you're tweeting for a living. It's just bizarre. To is be, that what they call it? I, well, I that's that what you call it. <laughs> well, that, that, there's a book called uh, The Society of Spectacle from uh, Guy Debord, who was sort of a oh. '60s Marxist theorist, and it's it's these sort of almost oracular aphorisms about the world in that sort of French philosopher sort of way, and a number of them are actually very prescient, um, in the sense that you know he saw what the digital not the digital but the image was doing to the world of text, and um, as many like Marshall McLuhan or Postman, right, like. You know, we think that what we're going through now is so dramatic, but in some sense, it's the final innings in a longer process. And in some sense, the the disruption was more obvious when you went from a non-media world to a, to a media world. Right. So anyhow, he has a bunch of pronouncements there that, that could have been, A, they're short, so they're almost like tw tweet length. And they could be tweets, you know, that somebody tweeted yesterday, but they were actually a French Marxist in the 60s. But in any case, he called the Society of Spectacles more or less what we live in now, which in society has become a series of commissions, effectively. I want to read this. It's not bad. Yeah, yeah. Just Google it. It's online. And, um, it, you know, it's not a book you read start to end. It's almost like Montesquieu's fables or, after, or you know, whatever. It's, um, but anyway, I call it the spectacle. Like, what else do you call this, Bridget? That, you know, we do this thing called a podcast. We yeah, tweet, I know. I it's crazy. Stuff, it's and then, crazy. And then you can make a living off of it, right? No, I, I think about how weird this is. I, like, right. overthink it. It's right. like, what, this is just so weird, and I'm very grateful for it. But I, I always just refer to it as, like, the discourse TM, you know? It's like the... Yeah. Like the culture or whatever. I don't I don't really know. And I didn't I didn't come from, you know, political science background. I didn't come from I really just stumbled my way into it. And so I feel like I have a fast I'm definitely like the the every man who stumbled into like the French court. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, what are all you idiots talking about? Well, but that's, I mean, that's part of your genius. I mean, I think it's part of uh, Rogan's genius as well, right? That he, um, you know, he just goes into a thing and puts people at their ease and gets them to open up and chat and that. That is valuable in many ways. So. 
yeah, it's valuable, but I, I still think that I've spent most of the last five years being like, what the hell is going on? You know, even in <laughs> the kitchen and, before, you and me both. <laughs> before we started talking, I'm like, what is happening? I always joke, I have this joke that I really want to do on stage, but I do it all the time in my dumb dumpster fire show about how, you know, the Twitter prompt is what is happening, but right. they totally misread it. It's actually, what is happening? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> like, just WTF, right? Yeah. Question mark. Yeah. Yeah. It's weird. I mean, I, I I tweeted it today. I think, and it's funny, I always joke, I'm not really a narcissist, I just play around the internet. And so I think the only way to actually quote, cope with being a professional narcissist is flipping the other way and going full solipsist. Like, my brain is the only thing in existence. Everybody, including you, Bridget, I'm sorry to say, is actually a projection of my subconscious. You're all NPCs in a personal video game. And I just, that's the only way I can grok it. Otherwise, mm. I, I think I'll literally go crazy. Because to wrap up my earlier. Uh, you know, anecdote, I, I, I was literally like medicated insane at the end of my writer period. I was living alone in this off-grid cabin yurt thing up in the Northwest. Oh, wow. My family was in San Francisco. There was a second book deal in the offing. My agent's like, where's the book? I was spending too long on Twitter, you know, the occasional pieces for Wired or Guardian or whatever. Uh, but yeah, it's, it, it, I literally went insane and I was on like benzodiazepines and SSRIs and shit by the end of it. I'm like, I need to go back to tech and do something real. This, mm. this world, this world of images mm. is just, is this, it's a funhouse mirror, it's a labyrinth. I have gotten lost in it. I will die here and must exit. And, um, <laughs> and now you're back. And now I'm back. And I've had friends, <laughs> and, then I, I, and friends who knew me during that time have warned me. I think, that I, I think this is really a bad idea. Um, but we'll see. Hopefully, maybe this time I'll grapple with it differently than I did. I mean, I feel pretty insane. Definitely. After only five years of it. You know, I look at people who have been in this space for like decades. I'm like, oh my God, how are you that a uh, crazy person? I, well, I think they are. I think everyone is mentally ill. And the, the, the key thing in our society is being mentally ill in the correct remunerative ways. Mm. You can't be mentally ill in the wrong ways. Like people like, particularly in tech, not to be like Mr. Tech Guy, but if you talk to a lot of startup founders, they're all lunatics. Elon Musk is a lunatic. Clearly. Mark Zuckerberg was a lunatic. Uh, they're all lunatics. And I, I don't think they're unique. Like, you know, the founders, Alexander Graham Bell was a lunatic. Um, you know, uh, Goodyear, Charles Goodyear of the vulcanization process was a, was a lunatic. Uh, Eastman, the founder of Kodak, was a, was a lunatic. So I think this is a, a common thing. And then everyone in media is basically a lunatic. I mean, you have to be. I don't, I don't know how you could be sort of a normal person. Um, there might be strange, there might be weird exceptions. Yeah, yeah. But, um, yeah. But so we really are just in a giant mental ward. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it, it's not it's not quite clear what to do about it. I mean, I, I think this is the bigger picture. I mean, I don't know how, like, 30,000 foot view. I can swear I've had no pot, but I think we need a cultural adaptation to tech. Like, regulation, new algorithms, none of that's going to change anything. I think humanity has to get their head around the fact that, like, everyone can talk to me via this little device that I'm holding up, which is my smartphone. Mm -hmm. Like, everybody's eyes and ears are in my pocket, and I'm in everybody's pocket, mm -hmm. right? Like, that is not something that Homo sapiens sapiens has been adapted to understand. Right. And, and, nor have our institutions been adapted to sort of grapple with that. Anyway, I don't know if you want to go there, but... I, I do. I, I love this conversation. Yeah. Is I mean, I think about this all the time, because I once had somebody on a podcast, my or an old podcast that I did, the first one I did, called Benched with an old comedian friend and we talked about like we were both in our 40s and just kind of or in our late 30s and divorced and we were like talking about dating we talked to people about their dating life but somebody came on and was talking about tech and saying that it was like um, you know boomers had no antibodies to it and right. that's why they fall for every freaking thing that comes their way and then us and Gen X we came of age around the time tech like, I got an email address my senior year, basically, of of high school. Right. And then, so we have a little bit of exposure to it, but we're considered the, like, the skeptical generation because right. we're the last generation that remembers life without it. Right. Analog. And then I did a roundtable with my nephews who were born with phones in their hands, basically, and it's fascinating to talk to them. They have so much more of an immunity to it. Yeah. But they also, it's weird because there's this whole cultural thing with the younger generation because they are better at tech than their parents. They think they're smarter than their parents about just everything in general. Right. Which makes sense when you're a kid. Yeah. Not until you're older do you respect wisdom. And so as a child, you're like, my dad's an idiot. He doesn't know how to program a TiVo. Right. What can I possibly learn from him? I'm fi I'm filming, his, fi teaching him how to use Zoom. 
No, yeah, I've often had that experience also, like, with boomers. Odd thing, but I used to sail a lot. I used to live on a boat, and, like, the sailing world, there's not a lot of young people on it. It's, like, I was always the youngest person on the dock, so it's typically, like, a boomer thing. Yeah. And this isn't fancy yacht club stuff, just to be clear. It's, like, you know, older used boats. Like, there's a whole boating world that's not super fancy or anything, right? But it tends to be boomers who are doing it for retirement or whatever. And you talk to boomers, and it's, like, man, they come off as, like, so naive and, like, a little <laughs> slow. But then you realize they possess all sorts of virtues that the current generation does not, that allows them to do things like sail a sailboat across the ocean, which right. many of my boomer friends have done, and I can't even imagine the younger generation like even getting their heads around to do it. And so, yeah, no, I agree. It's um, although I will say, my nephew, who is Gen Z, is a, in sailing, and is he? he's like wow. super into it. And tons of his friends are into it, and he, when we did our roundtable, we did screen times, and he had the lowest screen time, and huh? he was seventeen at the time. Where does he and, sail? Uh, on the East Coast. Oh, okay. And he's just very of this world. You know, he, he likes to be in the world, so he, and he's really restless, so he, nothing holds his attention online. Yeah, I think that's, yeah. The friends that I've seen that have actually coped with this have a rich in-person personal life, and, like, the internet is still just, like... One thing that people in the British generation like us can, can maybe convey to the next generation is that the internet didn't used to be this all-consuming thing. It's like a thing that you, right. s- that you like, logged in and did and kind of, like, went away and did something else. <laughs> because it, it took forever. It, right. It was not the prism through which you saw all of reality. Right. It was just, like, it was like making a phone call. It was, like, a subset of reality that, you know, fit a certain purpose but wasn't everything. And so, yeah, the people I think who, who deal normally is, like, somebody like your, I think you said your nephew? Yeah. yeah your nephew who, who has a, a rich social life. I think Bari actually mentioned in your podcast that she has a rich social and personal life that's kind of outside of the Twitter sphere, which keeps her sane. Or, I think you've got people, I definitely have friends, and they tend to be of the techie, somewhat on the spectrum side, who are totally digital native, even though they might be our age, and they just, like, I'm literally quoting somebody, like, anything worth doing is can be done better on the screen. That's just their mm. attitude. And they, they just live in that, and, like, I mean, they get exercise. They're, they're not, like, you know, like somebody... Like brains in a they're jar. Not, right, they're not, <laughs> they're not, like, you know, some basement dweller who weighs 500 pounds or something. Like, they're relatively normal people, but... But beyond like basic maintenance and maintaining their families, they could stay 18 hours connected to like the board, and that's fine. That is their entire life, and they're just totally native to that. And it, it's, I can do that too. But again, I think that's when it when it drives me crazy. It's weird. I don't know what we're doing here. We're just creating a generation of people who are either driven crazy by the internet or ignore it or just live totally inside it and are ready for the singularity. It's it. I'm going to just live, you know, on a hard drive. Yeah, it's it's fascinating to me because then the pandemic accelerated this. Exactly. So now we have this process that's already happening, and then the pandemic forced everybody online. And in some ways, you know, I saw this with, like, 12 Steps. It was really interesting because they adapted so quickly, and they had 12-step meetings online, but we were joking the other day, like, why didn't we always have that? <laughs> so, so you felt that improved the, you felt that improved the, the interaction and the... Well, I, I think every, we had to do it just for, they were already doing it in London, and, and Italy, and, uh, because the, obviously this hit, so, they, I think of the European 12-step community basically showed us what to do over here. And I was already going to Italian meetings and stuff like that when the pandemic was just ravaging Italy in the first wave because my old sponsor from here now lives in Rome. And I was like, cool, I get to see you. This is awesome. So then, I re- and that's why I was like overly obsessed with all of this stuff, even in February. And I was like, this shit's coming. And then we started doing meetings, and I was like, this is awesome. I can see my friends in New York. We, I could go to meetings in London. I, it was really cool. And everyone's like, look at how resilient we are in these 12-step programs. And, but when I see how it gave access to so many people, I was like, yeah, but why weren't we already doing this? <laughs> like, in some ways, it showed me just how, like, addicts literally have to be backed into a corner before they do anything. Because it seems natural to me that that would be something that existed, and it did not exist until the pandemic. But uh, Yeah, that's right. But, uh, you know, is it just addicts, though? Like, I, yeah, one of the things that's been interesting to see is, is to see my, my tech community of peers, how they dealt with the, the pandemic. And the feeling I was getting, like, four months into it, and, like, the narrative was still, like, the world is ending, world is ending, or whatever, right? It was like, man, everyone's, a lot of people are actually doing very well. And I actually mm. ran a Twitter poll, like, probably a year ago now, or maybe nine months ago, that was like, has COVID improved your life, stay the same, sucks, ruined it, right? right? 35%, which admittedly, my followership is probably heavily biased in one direction, but 35% said COVID actually improved their lives. Right. 
and, but, and right. the people who I who I saw grapple pajama with, jobbers, right? Although, but, <laughs> but they but they weren't total pajama type people, right? Like they had the people who actually did really well. Many of them left San Francisco or California, so they went to Utah, Texas, Florida, whatever. But there were there were self directed people who had their own family who who were kind of empowered to like go and do their jobs from wherever. And then you know Tyler Cohen in a very dismissive way called this like COVID was the great intelligence test, right? Suddenly, assuming you had a white collar profession, you could just stay at home, right? Right. And then like, well, does it ruin, ruin your life or do you turn what was like a downside into an upside? Right. And for a lot of my friends, it became an upside, and a lot of them moved away, and I think are never moving back. I don't think they're coming back to Francisco. Right. Not, not everybody, but a lot of them. And uh, you know, they just looked like, yeah, I don't need to. I do my job. It's all Zoom. It's all virtual, and I have time with my family, and that's it. I don't need anything else. I don't. I don't need to go out for drinks and this and that. And it sounds a little bit antisocial, but. I don't know. They seem to love it, and um, I'm undecided on it because I, I don't have such a rich, stable home life. But a lot of, for a lot of people, decoupling where you work and how you live and your family situation was a huge boon. And I think that that's big, right? Decoupling, decoupling how you pay the bills and, and where you pay the bills, right? Yeah. Not not just like for the global wealthy who could always do that, but like you know, for your average little pixel pusher, you know, white collar person, that's a big change. Yeah, I mean, I remember early in the pandemic walking around LA and noticing families having dinners together. And yeah. I was like, I either never noticed it or I've just never seen so many families sitting down to dinner together. And I'm sure people, because it's a grind in these cities. So, you know, dad's off at work and traveling. And when everybody was home, it did, there was more, I saw families out bike riding and there wasn't really much we could do here. And I'm really interested in seeing like the the divorce rates and stuff like this coming in the following year. So this show Sex Life came out recently on Netflix. Okay. And I've had the pleasure of seeing Sex Life. It's it's a show about it's my my friends in it and it's and it's a show about a woman who's choosing between like her old her old wild kind of flame and her she's in this marriage that's kind of boring and I was like, ah, oh, whatever, this seems so basic. You know, I was right. like, okay, cool, seems basic. I thought people would like it because there's tons of sex in it and they've been locked up. But I cannot tell you how many women have called me and talked to me and are like, I'm leaving my husband. I can't, I'm watching Sex Life. I can't watch Sex Life. I was like, what is going on in America? I didn't, I don't know what it's tapping into, but it's tapping into something crazy in the female population of this country that I didn't even know was there. Yeah, I think, yeah, I mean, getting back to the COVID thing, I, I, I'll address the sex life thing, but the COVID thing I think is going to have, uh, could potentially have lots of long range ramifications from where people live to even domestic architecture, right? Like I've been shopping around for houses off and on in, in different places. And just like the concept of the Zoom room is now a thing real estate brokers wow. pitch. It's like, this is the Zoom room. It's not, it's not like the study, the den, the whatever, like the five or six rooms that classically sort of define the middle class home. No, no, this is the Zoom room now. That's and the, crazy. And the fact that people are like designing their homes to be partially private, partially public spaces, which, you know, is how people often used to live. Roman aristocrats would like do their business at home. Too. Right. Or, you know, whatever, you know, the wealthy watch titans or whatever used to have like their study where they would take meetings or whatever. But now that's, you don't have a room where you would take meetings, but you have a Zoom room in which we, you do work at home and you have to separate sort of your personal life from, from that. So it's interesting. And then the sex life thing, yeah, I don't know. I, you know, it's weird. I think what might be the problem, it's like, it's imagine you change the rules of football such that you couldn't throw the ball, right? Who you'd actually have in your team would radically change, right? Right. right? Like, well, okay, we don't need the quarterback with the throwing arm anymore. We need like a bunch of running backs or whatever. So if you're living in a world in which you're actually having dinner with this person every day, maybe you would select a different mate. So it's not as if it's the death of marriage necessarily. It's just like that husband under those conditions, you you know, that you used to marry. Now you don't want to see that guy's face anymore. You pick somebody else. I don't know. I'm trying to be optimistic. Oh, yeah. It. It's so, it's crazy because I was talking to my therapist about this too, and she was saying that it either, from just her perspective as a, like, marriage counselor as well, she was like, it seems like it's either strengthened, it either strengthened right. your marriage or it ended it. There doesn't seem to be a whole lot of, you know, in between. <laughs> like, you, and you either got stronger as a couple and it bonded you, and, and or, or it, it was like, I can't do this anymore. Because I think a lot of people were in relationships where their work kept them separate and right. enough that they were like, I'll just endure. And the minute they were locked in a house together, it was like, nope. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. We've got a very different kind of sponsor for this episode, The Jordan Harbinger Show. 
a podcast you should definitely check out since you're a fan of high quality, fascinating podcasts hosted by interesting people like yours truly. The show covers such a wide range of topics through weekly interviews with heavy hitting guests. And there are a ton of episodes you'll find interesting since you're a fan of this show. I'd recommend our listeners check out recently he had on John Acuff. And that was a great conversation. It was all about overthinking. John is really just hilarious. And they seem to have a great rapport. John talked a lot about the soundtrack of those repetitive thoughts that play automatically in your head. He also recently had on Sam Harris, who's been on this show. So if you like Sam on this show, check him out on the Jordan Harbinger show. Get a different interview and get a different perspective on Sam. We really enjoy this show here at Walk-Ins Welcome, and we think you will as well. So search for The Jordan Harbinger Show. That's H-A-R-B as in boy, I-N as in Nancy, G-E-R, on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts. I I wonder about like the three million kids they estimate that fell through the cracks with the schools. The whole school thing has been, how old are your kids? Uh, they are five, uh, nine, and eleven. Okay, so they're in the school ages. I think yeah. it was really hard on the kids. Yeah, yeah, and and on the parents. I mean, that's the other thing. A lot of these people that I just mentioned who who left California are very self directed. They've kind of given up on the schools, and yeah. I, mean, they, I mean, they're seeing what's being taught on Zoom for the first time, and they're yeah. seeing how effective it is, and often it's effective, often usually it's not. And so, like, ho- it's a lot of conversations with homeschooling and stuff that I'm hearing now. Yeah, like, or tutors are like unconventional software, but whatever, but just conventional 30 kids in a room sitting there listening to teacher drawn on. Even even if the school's open, it doesn't seem to be like the, the default anymore. That's crazy. I'm like, didn't you know this is what was going on in your kid's school? Like, how did you not know this is what school was? It literally hasn't changed since we were in school. Right. It's the same thing. <laughs> maybe worse. Just kind of maybe gotten worse. But yeah, that, that's been interesting to me to hear too, where parents are like, I can't believe what these kids are being taught. And a lot of people, I heard this, and particularly from San Francisco, are leaving because of the school situation, which part of me understands, like, you want to vote for your with your feet or whatever, but part of me gets mad because a lot of, I hope, it's not the people who voted for all of this stuff who oh, no, are, no, no, like, no. abandoning it. No, no, no. I don't, I'm, well, indirectly, perhaps, but I think, yeah, it's weird. I think, you know, well... To the extent that I understand SF politics, I, I called in I, I called in some of the famous Zoom calls with SFUSD. I don't know how much I remember, it, yeah. Back in the day, I remember. It, it, I'm not my my kid my one SF kid isn't even in the public school, so I'm really kind of seeing it as a as a tourist almost. But I, a friend of mine is heavily engaged in that and is on the other side of most of those debates and is blocked by all the board members on Twitter and all this stuff. And and so she, like when she would go on, she'd say, "Hey, here's the Zoom link." I'm like okay fine i'll go watch it and it was like you know jerry springer but sad right because it was just like it was these board members who are obviously very ideological who don't seem motivated to actually like find a solution to the to this obvious problem and um it was specifically around the lowell thing so lowell is like the prestige high school which is you know it's an it's an elite school but it's, it's a public school and it's admissions only it's hard to get in right but it's like it's kind of like berkeley inside the uc system right, right. it's supposed to be the sort of elite but but public university right right and they just wrecked it. I mean, they, and it was obviously like a total political. It's like, oh, we can't hold the exam because of COVID. And then, like, cynics are like, oh, well, that's just an excuse. They're just going to kill it. And then, true enough, within six to nine months, they basically did. And they actually, on the calls, they had the parents. And it, it sounds a little pathetic, but realize, like, the kids' futures are at stake. So you can see why they'd pull out the emotional steps. They put the kid on the call. Like, an eighth grader's like, yeah, I, I studied, you know, and I, and I really got into this. And I remember one kid cut was so sad. I almost went to Frank. It's like, you know, my parents, like, we just don't have a lot. And this is my one chance that, like, getting, like, a real education. Yeah. Like, on the con. And it's like, oh, my God. And then, of course, they just, they just crushed it. <laughs> they just, they didn't care. It's like, oh, my God, this is so horrible. It's so horrible. These, these things, these school boards are out of control. Yeah. And they, I mean, they just, they seem completely unaccountable. And that, well, now there's a recall thing going on. I know. I saw that. A I couple would, of those SF, um school board members like three i believe yeah they're 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 well they're trying to recall uh chessa who's the da and then three of the school board members it's it's interesting because i was actually listening to um david Sachs, who's a prominent sfuc and we're on talking about a lot of these efforts he's actually backing the recall efforts and there's other tech billionaires 
<laughs> funding the anti-recall efforts. Uh, and so in some sense, it's actually split in many ways, kind of the, you know, big money people in, in the city. And so it really has divided. I, for the record, have signed the recall. So anyhow, it's, it's this bizarre dust up. And it's, you know, it's interesting that like typically SF has had corruption and incompetence forever. It's always been the case. If you actually read the deep history of much of San Francisco, it's just full of corruption and incompetence. Mm-hmm. It always has been. But in this case, it's like they went a step too far. Once the kids are involved, then it's when parents who might normally just like shrug their shoulders and not care, that's when they revolt. Which reminded me, it's funny, in 1960s Cuba, when the revolution came, um, you know, it went Soviet and communist and hard edge very, very quickly. And, uh, you know, there were rumors going around that the kids would be sent to education camps, or at the very least put in these little pioneer camps, which is like the, the socialist youth, which they were. And that's when the parents freaked out. That's when they grabbed my parents, for example, literally, and like bought them tickets to Miami. Like my grandparents couldn't get out, but they put the kids on the plane and sent them alone to the United States. Tens oh of thousands. Oh my God. Oh yeah, tens of thousands. There's a whole thing called Pedro Pan, uh, uh, the Peter Pan uh, thing. Probably one of the biggest movements of refugee children since like World War II, probably. Tens of thousands of kids were sent, often alone, to the United States. Some were actually cared for by the Catholic Church. Uh, some were, in the case of my parents, they had distant family in the United States, so they were actually, you know, distant cousins or uncles uh, housed them when they landed, so they didn't have to go to, like, the orphanage in the Catholic school. But in any case, it was, that whole wave happened when, you know, they kind of came for the kids, right? Mm. And uh, not that I'm equating what happened in communist Cuba with what's happening in San Francisco, though, frankly, they're probably not as far apart as you might guess, <laughs> but the fact that the state comes for your kids and says, well, we're going to... We're either not going to educate them and do what we should be doing, which is opening schools, or we're going to educate them in this weird way, and then suddenly, boom, parents freak out, which would explain a lot of the kickback to this CRT business and a lot of these school board hearings you're seeing where parents are getting arrested, screaming and yelling at the school board. Like, I think something something about the children touches you in a primal way. That, yeah. Um, it's interesting watching the CRT debate go just, like, mainstream in the past couple of weeks it's driven me off twitter i'm like i'm out i can't i'm out of this conversation you know do you ban it all these things and i'm glad to see parents pushing back you know i'm I'm grateful to see parents who are like okay enough and i do think that like in california it's crazy i don't know what are they going back to school in the fall i don't even know if they're yeah i don't know that they're gearing up for it it's I mean, my kid is, but she, she goes to a, a private school. So it's to sp- specifically not have to deal with this sort of thing. Yeah, um, it's so wild. But I just feel this is what I've been saying this whole time is these kinds of mechanisms and lockdowns, it just seems like it hurts the kids who, who need the help the most and who need the structure or the school or the lunches or whatever. I, I, don't, I don't know. I get really disheartened with all of it. I, I don't understand the people who are saying like we care about the children so much we're going to keep the schools closed forever <laughs> well those are, well, those are the teachers you need talking yeah but yeah yeah but it's so and it's frustrating because i think teachers get you know bad i really think people need to take more aim at the teachers unions and less at the teachers because they're like on freaking they're fundraising on go fund me every year it's like hey here's Please give us money because I guess all the money goes to administration now or something. I don't get it. I don't, don't I don't understand. I don't understand anything. All I've learned in the past five years is that I literally don't understand how anything works. And it's a miracle that this country even functions at all based on what I've seen, particularly in the past year. Yeah, I mean, uh, there are some positives, though. The vaccine development was incredibly fast. Yeah, that was cool. And, uh, in fact, the U.S., once it finally got its ass in gear, the rollout was actually remarkably fast and beat the EU by a lot. Not quite as fast as Israel, but... um, So, I, you know, I think we can often be a little bit too pessimistic. And also, like, the U.S. is a varied place, right? Like, I don't know that the lockdowns were mismanaged as much in other states as they were in California. No, they weren't. (laughs) Um, it's so. like going to another world. I was just in Nashville, and it's literally like another country completely. Right. But the narrative in the sort of more blue states is that, like, oh, the red states are just suffering through. It's like, well, <laughs> doesn't quite seem to be. I go to Nevada, and things seem just fine. Yeah. And I cross the border back to California, things are different. So, yeah. Although it does feel like a little bit more normalcy is coming back. Yes, finally. I was yes. at the Hollywood Bowl on the 4th of July. There was no, you know, you didn't have to have be vaccinated or show proof of it. Everybody was chill. If you wanted to wear a mask, okay. But most most of the people weren't. It was 
there's still lines time. down the, there's still lines on the block for the fancy brunch places in San Francisco. I mean, nature is healing. Clearly. <laughs> <laughs> clearly. It's such it's so wild. I I don't know. I've been working on my dumb book forever. Oh, what what what's this book? The I'm, Accidental I'm, Pundit. It's okay. about how I, it's just the story of like how an idiot <laughs> tweeted her way into the center of the culture wars. And I just happened to be like in the wrong place at the wrong time or the right place at the right time, depending on how you view it. Bridget, you're way underselling yourself. You're not the accidental pundit. You're the providential woman who just walked into the debate and said exactly what needed to be said no. to move the debate in the right direction. No. I don't I don't make any... I actually, yesterday, was like, what am I doing? I feel like I was having the existential crisis that you described up in the woods. Yeah. Where I was like, what the fuck am I doing? I was seriously like, I want to go back to waiting tables. At least <laughs> it's in the world. Yeah. And That's at right. least it's like interacting with real people, and there's a there's a wait staff shortage. <laughs> there definitely is. It's funny you drive around <laughs> rural America. There's help wanted signs everywhere. Mm -hmm. like, it's just uh, well, I read this cool article about how teens are re really capitalizing on this. Are they? Yeah, yeah. Why not? Yeah, sure. They're normally getting you know booted out of the job market, and now they're like, please, teen. I think Gen Z is pretty pretty dope. I have a lot of hope for them. Other than the Gen Z kids that are on TikTok, they're they're they worry me. They're hopeless. <laughs> okay, TikTok. Do you think TikTok is just the death of Western intellectual life? Um, I don't. It's weird. The whole vibe of it creeps me out. You know, there's like the the little soldiers repeating these like long, short clipped kind of mantras of like prona these like long lectures that they do in this very weird clip and edit in this kind of strange way I, I, and even though scrolling just how you can just go and go and go until as my husband says your brain turns into pudding yeah it's just true but some but some of the some of the shots are actually very clever yeah so the the, the current, some of the stuff is crazy good right some of it's crazy i get sent from friends who are big tiktokers and some of them are actually super brilliant like yeah you know, actually you know inspired What's weird about it, this is one of the things that, one of the bees that has flown into my bonnet that just will not fly out, is like, you know, textual versus visual or, or oral culture, right? Which is, I'm not going to give the whole spiel that I usually give here, but, you know, it's a different way of looking at the world, to interact as we are, you know, face-to-face, -face, oral culture, we personally know each other, body language, et cetera, versus reading, you know, a 6,000 word wall of text in the New Yorker, which nobody does anymore. Nobody actually reads the New Yorker. Even the New Yorker writers probably don't. And Did so, anyone read the New Yorker? <laughs> yeah, you have to read the cooperate with the umlaut to pronounce it correctly. <laughs> it's funny, when the New Yorker Union was striking, they actually used an umlaut in cooperate, like in the sign. It was like, oh my God, it's so ridiculous. Like nobody else in the Western, in the English-speaking Western world puts an umlaut in cooperate. And they do, and they did in the sign. But in any case, getting back to the visual thing, you know, I remember, again, we're part of the bridge generation. So I'm sure you remember when you're, I remember when I was in elementary school, that like the original memes, like some verbal tick or some cute way of phrasing something, or some little three-second act you would do, like the equivalent of a TikTok video, would just catch fire throughout the entire school, or even the entire, like Miami, I was raised in Miami, which is like a bit of a linguistic bubble, because it had a lot of Hispanic culture, but English, and just kind of isolated from other cities, and so like I, I just recall things would just take over the culture, mm -hmm. and TikTok is just the digital shareable version of that. So yeah. I, I don't know that it's that different, but it, I think what where your brain does get obviously subverted is where you're seeing like a thousand of them at once. When we were kids, you would see three or four of those a day or whatever, and it would just be kind of different. So, I, I don't know. I'm maybe not... I, I do think that the, the oral mind, the, the mind that interacts via that mechanism is very different than the one that can actually look at text. And so the one thing I, I wonder about, getting back to your point about, like, are we going to adapt to, like, the internet as it is? And, like, the boomers seem dumb, right? They seem tech dumb. But that said, guess what? They make, you know, they created the world whose ruins arguably we're living in, right? Can you maintain the world as we know it today with the new internet mind. That's where I'm kind of dubious, right? Like mm. I, I'm not sure that you can maintain, you know, the nation state came out of the enlightenment in textual culture, right? Before that, the notion of having one body of law and one nominal people, a little bit of a fourth concept, over, you know, four time zones with populations in the millions was kind of a novel concept, right? right. You, you had a sort of feudal patchwork of allegiances. It was very different, right? And so can you maintain that, right, um, in a world where yeah, people interact with you TikTok. I don't know. Right. I mean, th I saw some that were just genius where they were yeah. layering on top of each other, and there was the one that went viral that was really cool where they just turned it into like a hostage situation by the end, and it was a, it was just really creative and cool. And I think that I'm not one of those people who are like the kids these days because I feel like every generation feels that way. But how do you convey, like, a serious thought beyond a TikTok that way? No, my, my sister is like, my kids have no attention span. None. 
Right. She was like, their attention span is, she's like, they don't watch TV, TV's done. Once TV comes to Gen Z or whatever, she's like, they don't. And to them, sitting in front of a television is like our version of having a landline. It's right. like a stagnant right. piece of technology that, at least with, and I was thinking about this, at least with technology, it's interactive. I don't know if that's good or bad, but television is so passive. You're right. just like being programmed. Whereas I think with the younger generation, they're m- interacting much more. They have friends. But my sister was like, ah, oh, the preteen drama online is like take normal junior high and then e- extrapolate that yeah. to exponential levels of the internet. And so, and I don't think kids see any point in learning just for the sake of learning. You know, like memorizing things, they're like, why would I do this? They did this study years ago on kids. They said, here's what, here's the information you need to know. Here's where you can find it, and here's what the information is. And all the kids, it was something like 90% of the kids remembered where to go look for the information as opposed to what the information was. That's probably right. I mean, I remember back again in the analog days, a lot of exams were basically information retrieval and recall, mm-hmm. which I don't know how much value it has, but... The problem there is probably with the testing, right? That's a very crude way. Like, if I give you, like, a quiz for a book, right, I would literally ask you the four things that factually you would need to know. While I think reading a book and actually slogging through 300 pages of text or Hannah Crandon or whatever, it shapes your mind in other ways. Mm -hmm. As an an intellectual exercise, like, you are literally compiling language code and recreating it in your brain rather than just, like, staring at pixels. And two, to the degree that you can actually develop empathy with... I don't know why I picked Anna Cranin out of the air, but Anna Cranin's plight and why she might throw herself in front of the train out of her love. Right? Spoiler alert. So, sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry. I, I know that season didn't quite come out yet. Uh, it might be a surprise for some of you. But uh, she dies at the end. Sorry. <laughs> um, but that, you know, that's a mental exercise that I think it's hard to do otherwise. And yeah. That's, that's some aspect of learning. I have trouble doing it now. If I didn't have this podcast and people who write books... I wouldn't, I, I'd be worried about my ability to can s- still read a book. I, it takes, I've noticed this, I've started noticing what happens when I sit down to read a book now. And it takes me probably 10 to 15 minutes of reading the same sentence maybe 15 times before my brain clicks into reading mode and then I can let myself be absorbed by the book. But it, I do feel my brain switching from some yeah. other operating system to reading a book operating system. Yeah, I mean, the other thing, and again, I, I hate just banging on this thing, but this, this is my second book idea, the, the question of, like, oral culture how, and how is, visual culture, how is it different, right? It's very emotive, right? Mm-hmm. Like, you, you get sucked into that TikTok or, like, the one little viral clip of um, Daniel Craig saying it's the weekend has gone to the oh, bar. Right. It's, it's literally fucking five seconds. And the guy just says it's the weekend. And, and it's just somehow, the way he said right, it. Right. It's, it's the tone. It's his look because he's this dashing dude. Like something about it just engages you in an emotional memory. <laughs> like even now I'm replaying in my head. But Because um, he's so like, it, you want him to go, it's the weekend. But he's like, it's the weekend. Right. He's like, he's somewhat exhausted. Right. <laughs> yeah. He's like, yes, where's my pint? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but that, and that's great in a way. And there's, there's great things about old culture. But in some sense, it's hard to analyze facts in a disinterested way, right? Like, mm. objective reality, like, let's go look something up in the sense of, like, there's an external description of reality or there's an external opinion about the world that I just judge and evaluate without necessarily viscerally, emotively, you know, engaging with it. That's hard to do through visual media, right? Like, it's hard to, I don't know, see somebody giving a speech and not see your pulse quicken or feel feelings of disgust or whatever. One thing I find strange is that there's so many things going on in the world that if they can't be sort of reconciled into this dialogue yeah. of like CRT is the bad binary. or CRT is good or whatever the hell the case may be where there's this set of people on this side and this set of people on this side yelling, if you can't project it into what are frankly fairly simplistic narratives, like it doesn't exist, right? So like to cite one example, this week, the president of Haiti was like whacked. This like literally is crazy to assassinated. Me. Like a bunch of mercenaries showed up at the presidential palace. They were like Colombian and American. Right. So yeah. One guy was caught on video and it was an American accent. It was very clearly an American I think they were. Pretending- I think they were Haitians who lived in yeah, America. Yeah, I think they were yeah. Haitian Americans, um, and they're pretending to be a DEA, DEA operation or yep. something. So they kind of fooled the guards, and then they they literally shot up the place and killed the president. And you know, it got reported on. Again, it's not it's not like I'm alleging some sort of media cover up conspiracy, but it just didn't play 
in that oral sort of discourse that we're part that, that is the conversation. Like Twitter is the conversation, let's face it. Like right. getting on the cover of, of the New York Times, like does it matter <laughs> unless in some sense it expo- you know, it reveals itself into the Twitter discourse and all the downstream stuff from there. Another example I cited was the building collapse in Miami, um, which, you know, big deal, major tragedy, 150 Americans or more dead. And like it got reported on again, it was on CNN, but it didn't really play until it kind of got fed into either the climate change Florida narrative or DeSantis, who obviously has presidential aspirations or whatever, then it could somehow be reconciled into that, into into the epic poetry of fighting over DeSantis in Florida or fighting over COVID or fighting over climate change, then it could be sort of parsed. But as like, okay, how the hell is it that like a poured concrete rebar building in a major American city just pancakes, right? Like that, that is a question that's going to be handled by structural engineers or, you know, whatever local, Miami Herald, the local paper obviously have very good reporting on, of like how is it like in the permitting process and the maintenance process that you get to a point where a building just collapses, right? But that's a very different conversation, right? And it's boring. And it's, and well, I mean, it's, I mean, it's boring. It's, it's boring if it's not the, your family that's in, in the, the rubble. Discourse, <laughs> right, you right, know, yeah, like it's yes. boring details of like the, it's like, any of these conversations that I think are really important and really matter. But that, but that, but that was exactly Plato's critique, right? That Twitter is so amusing that if, it does, that if you don't have that emotional, visceral pull to the story, you'll just ignore it. And that's exactly what's happening. I'm guilty of adding to this yeah. garbage. I yeah. mean, yeah. I have, I love this podcast because it's, it's like the, I think the yin to my dumpster fire, which really was me. I'm like, I need to take my. Twitter account and turn it into a show because I feel like people aren't hearing. I hear all the time on Twitter, they're like, I can hear you saying this. And that was the exact reason I started Dumpster Fire. Because I was like, I don't think people are hearing the tone in which I'm writing, right. which is very tongue in cheek 90% of the time. Well, that, that's the other thing, right? Like I said, Twitter is oral media until it isn't, right? And right. it's like textual media, then it sucks. Because again, if you were like, I've often said that like we could all the nastiness on Twitter could be like cut down by one of two things. Either having there be like a binding duel button. Like someone insults me and it's like, okay, I press this button, you opt in and it's pistols at dawn, right? Like, <laughs> then that's it, motherfucker. Like that's it. Forget blocking and canceling or whatever. We're just gonna, it one of us will not come it. out of here alive. <laughs> or two, probably the nicer way to do this is like you instantly go to a 30 second video of the person like playing with their kids or speaking in normal mm. voice. And then it's like, oh my God, this is like a real person. I, the, the first time I realized that that me, not that I'm much of anything online, but had left the orbit of like regular person who just tweets and no one gives a shit about to like this totemic thing, this avatar, this AGM brand that had nothing to do with the real me. And that just meant something in people's minds and they're gonna interact with that thing and not even think that there's like a human related to it. I think it was like when Prop C, this homelessness bill thing in SF was passed and it was well into my writing career. Like I already had a byline, I published a book, but it hadn't, it hadn't quite hit me. People were talking about me like in the third person or, mm. or making me out to be some tech bro guy who literally wanted to like put, you know, homeless people in gulags or something, which of course was not what I was saying at all. I was just asking a question about Pop C. And um, that's when I, it hit me that like, man, this is, it feels impromptu and personal and like you have access to like, you know, the Bridget brand or, or my or whatever, but it's not that, that at all, right? Like at some point, textual culture comes in it's like no it's just it's like a name it's an abstract thing it's not the real person right. and that's why i think it's often it's weird it's the union of worsts yes. right it's like it feels impromptu and informal and direct and emotional and agonistic but then it's searchable it's indexable so like the embarrassing tweet from six years ago is going to get you canceled right. or and there's that level of remove in which it's like okay i don't see this as a person anymore i see it as a figurehead like you know the way that we would talk about stalin not consider his feelings obviously right uh, or, or any figure rather than right. president or whatever right um so yeah, that's that to me is why it's so dysfunctional. I, and I, not that I know how to how to fix it, um, I, I do think that things like, although it's kind of petered out a little bit, Clubhouse for example, social audio, I think, which is. I thing. thought Clubhouse was terrifying. I spent two days really? in there. And what do you think? I hated it. Really? Why? Why'd you hate it? Because I well, at first of all, my joke was come for the group therapy, stay for the struggle session, <laughs> because I was in, <laughs> I was in one room and it was like a, a it was a. I think it was a pretty just generally woke room. And I I was like, wow, this is like a zoo of the people on Twitter that I didn't actually (laughs) think were real. So in, in your, to your point of oral versus textual and the worst of both worlds, Clubhouse revealed to me that these people that I thought were parodies. And I was always like, no, these people are just, I'm, I'm imagining that they're worse than they are. They're as bad as they're you thought. They're as bad as I thought. 
And that was really distressing to me. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah, that's, I mean, I, I, de- I definitely know what you're talking about. I was in a few of those rooms. And I, then yeah. some girl got kicked out, yeah. and she came back in, and they allowed her to apologize <laughs> after oh, she got booted for suggesting that speech might not be violent. And then they, <laughs> then when they kicked her out, they all had a conversation about holding space, the, like therapy language. Yeah. And my husband, who's a therapist, is like, this is group therapy. He's like, this is literally what it sounds like to run a group therapy session, only no one's running it. It's just people re-traumatizing each other in a a, a dysfunctional group therapy session. Then they let her back in. Then it became like a struggle session where she had to keep apologizing, but she didn't apologize the right way. I was like, this is fucking nuts. I didn't think this was actually real. And then I heard a couple of things like that and then the anti-semitism got crazy oh yeah I, were, I was i was in that room i remember that one there were a couple of rooms and then i was and then i heard like then brett was trying to be weinstein had one room and i was like this is nuts too and then a lot of the other people who were in there it felt like a lot of people who really loved hearing themselves talk oh yeah definitely. which was the other side of it so then i would wander into rooms and i'm like oh man i i cannot have i also think Something happened at the end of the Trump era where many of us who were in this space and pushing back against the left were having this conversation about cancel culture and to our detriment often. And then when Trump left, it became okay for a certain type of person who is in the mainstream media or was allowed to talk about these certain things. And then they started talking about them. And I was like already bored with this conversation. So... I'm like, welcome to the party, guys. I'm glad to have you. I'm I'm happy that you can just pivot out of, like, this is this is great for you that you get to talk about this now. And well, well Richard, they were too they were too busy in the resistance movement. Against Trump yeah, but they weren't even really in the resistance. It was like it was just <laughs> people was. who were kind of like biding their time in their like legacy media jobs until they could they could fight the left, even though they were kind of not for the left the whole time it was it was weird so i got i was just bored i'm that's like the crt thing i'm like i'm so bored i if i had kids i'd be fighting this fight but i don't have to care yeah (laughs) yeah i know yeah well neither do i because i've kind of bought my way out of it which is totally craven and cowardly i know but i don't know i don't i don't i don't like the culture war like there's certain aspects of it like I, i did one piece on the whole Latinx thing that which I think is completely silly and to some degree I feel it's kind of my lane coming from an Hispanic background so I, I did write about that but more broadly like I just it's it's I can't deal with the grief and I you know I don't even understand education you know you know one thing I think we should all do we should all just like express your opinions like there's a few things in the world that I feel I know about that I can add something new and the rest of it like I have opinions because obviously I'm not you know I'm a private citizen with opinions but I don't feel like you know I don't think they're unique or exceptional like I don't need to share them like yeah. I, I have an opinion on CRT I'm not going to share it I'm not going to claim I know and that you should listen to my opinion I don't know whatever like I just uh, I don't yeah. know anything I mean I've been reading about it and learning about it and I'm curious about I like hearing both sides I was there were some conversations I liked hearing. I really like getting out of the like discourse and into the stuff that I just knew nothing about. Those rooms mm-hmm. were some. It, to me, it was like I'm at a convention center and I can pop into rooms and it's people having conversations. Like I always said, Twitter is like high school and Clubhouse is like the house party that the rich kid has. <laughs> and you have to yeah. be invited to it. And right. there's all these different rooms with different things going on. Or it felt very much like a convention center where there was different conference, you know, different topics happening in different rooms. But so, the, the reason I mentioned Clubhouse as a positive, though, is that it's a little bit better in that you do feel that human connection, for better or worse, right? Like, you can feel the quaver in the person's voice when they're on social audio. And, you know, most people aren't to- total sociopaths that they would sit there and troll somebody cruelly, like hearing their voice and feeling some level of human connection. And also, there's good... See, the problem, I think, in the groups you're in, you need a good admin. You need, like, a bouncer in the bar who's like, all right, you, out of here. <laughs> or just, you're not invited up to begin with, right? Like, it's, in our social lives, we don't just let random strangers do a dinner party and, like, see what happens. It's like, no. And if you invite someone you know and they get out of hand, you kick them out, right? And then so I think, you know, we should look to see the structures that we've built to, like, coordinate our real IRL lives. If you were to bake those into the mechanism of a lot of these apps, I think things would probably go a lot more smoothly. But and- I don't know if people even want it. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. I was surprised to learn that health insurance doesn't always cover the full cost of an emergency medical flight. 
Even with comprehensive coverage, you can still get hit with substantial deductibles and co-pays. Protect your family and your finances with an Air MedCare Network membership. As a member, if an emergency arises, the expense of air medical transport is completely covered when flown by an AMCN provider. Membership costs as little as $85 a year and covers your entire household, every day, even when you are away from home. That's just pennies a day. If this podcast series has taught us anything, it's that the unexpected can happen. An AMCN membership is protection no family should be without. For a limited time, as a Walk-In's Welcome listener, you'll get up to a $50 e-gift card when you join. Simply visit airmedcarenetwork.com forward slash welcome and use offer code welcome. You know- I mean, here's my fear. And this is what I was saying in the kitchen before we started is I think people have got addicted to certain things that are really bad, like fear being one of them. And I know that growing up in kind of a crazy environment, how hard it is to deprogram yourself from being addicted to that fight or flight or being addicted to dysfunction or whatever. So I think we were in a very dysfunctional cycle, obviously, that got I was like I was saying I was writing this book and it's like you could not write this script if if you were like okay yeah we're gonna have Trump be the president all right that's a little far fetched but okay and then when the election year comes there's gonna be a global plan you'd be like get the fuck out of here that's like it's too crazy I can't believe we lived through it (laughs) and I don't know that anyone's really processed it and I don't I don't think that people want to process it either. I mean, I know I'm not looking forward to 20 Netflix specials about comedians baking bread and like being in the <laughs> pandemic. No one really wants to think about it. They want. I think a lot of people are like, "Let's okay, let's just move on." But the craziness seems really unleashed too in certain ways. I mean, I sometimes like with Dumpster Fire because we just make fun of everything on Dumpster Fire, and particularly there's so much low hanging fruit. A lot of the times coming out of the left, just craziness. Yeah. And then we end up sounding like MAGA, you know. <laughs> it's like, or, or the Babylon Bee. But yeah. Or the Babylon Bee, but it just it you end up the the binary has taken over everything, and I think people become addicted to. I worry, like fighting, because yeah. why did Clubhouse peter out? I what, think. What lo- is your I theory? Think the, I think the lockdown just ended. <laughs> people started seeing each other in real life, or I I don't know. It's a good question. I I still think social audio. There's something there that worked. That I think will will uh, Twitter Spaces is still going right. I did a Twitter Spaces with Ben Thompson yesterday, and it was very well attended. Big crowd, a lot of tech people, people from the FTC were FTC were there. So I think social audio does have a certain magic to it. I, I don't know. I think there'll be some version of it. I, not to, I have no stake in the company, but David Sachs um, and the co-founders, I forget their names, started a company called Colin. It's kind of like Clubhouse, but you actually it's almost like podcasting. You also have a link, so you can share it later. That was, that was one of the problems with Clubhouse is that like if you missed it, like you missed it, like there's nothing to share. And so I don't know. I think that was one of my issues with it because people always right. invited me to rooms and I was like, what exactly is the point for me to show up to this thing? Right. I'm there's a high chance that I'll get in trouble for saying something right. and there's a low reward. I'm not gonna build my following, I'm not it's not marketing, it's essentially like, I mean, it's yeah. not scalable. Yeah, I mean, you sussed this up faster than I did. I, I, I hosted a show with a bunch of tech people, Mark Andreessen, Catherine Boyle, and a bunch of other people. And it was great. We had people like Sam Harris on, and Matt Taibbi, and Tom Holland, like serious intellectuals and stuff. And, like, great combos, and it's all gone. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, now what? Um, yeah. So, yeah, clearly there's a, there's a hole in the product there. Well, that's what I was saying. I'm like, if I could do walk-ins welcome live and have you sit on Clubhouse. Yeah. Wouldn't that be cool? And then do it and have an audience that was listening, and then you could do a Q&A afterwards with real people, and then I could record that. I would totally use well, Clubhouse. This is going to be music to David Sachs' ears, because that's that's the company he funded. That's what I planned. So I did Twitter Spaces with Ben Thompson, this guy named Eric uh, Sufert, who's a big blogger in the mobile tech space. Ben Thompson, as people probably know, is author of Stratechery, who kind of invented the paid newsletter model, okay. and he has a huge following in the tech space. Um, he, you know, he's a little wonky insider-ish thing, but he's, he's done very well for himself. He created a subset before there was a subset. Right. Anyways, so we, we did a Twitter Spaces, and I just discovered some a follower told me that when you download your Twitter data, as part of it, you actually get the MP3 file for your Twitter space, at least for the 30 days after it. So I'll probably actually end up posting it. But it's that idea that you're saying, which is 
we had a great convo, informal, you know, on the fly sort of thing. It'd be great to have a sh- you know a link to share it. And so uh, yeah, we'll see. I'm sure the innovation machine will kick in. Yeah, that's what I was saying. I was like, hey, if I could turn this into content, then I'd be all over it. But it's really just like me attending something to what? <laughs> right. Yeah. And do you feel, just out of curiosity, I mean, this little meta because we were talking about a podcast and a podcast. I mean, do you feel that you do a lot of editing and stuff or that you'd rather go the other way and be more improvisational and just have like a walk-in thing, jam for two hours and just post it and that's it? I mean, we do not a lot of editing on this. Okay. So we'll, ed- sh- we'll, we'll try and make people sound better with O's, ums, whatever. If people are say, I know how comfortable you can get on a podcast. I want to give people always the opportunity to feel safe. And if there's something that they regretted saying or that they just really didn't want public, um, I just always offer that to any of my guests because I know how it is. I've, it's happened to me where I have like that feeling of dread where you leave a podcast you're like, oh, shit, what did I say? <laughs> um, and we do same thing with Dumpster Fire. We do one take. We don't stop and re-say things. Maybe we will a little bit, but... I want to take Dumpster Fire on the road and do Dumpster Fire live. So wow. my rule has always been one take, one hour. We treat this like a show because we're not going to have this. I don't want to get in the habit of have, being like it would be annoying for an audience. to No transcription, no text like you don't transcribe. I know. Um, for, for which one? Uh, well, either one. I guess Dumpster Fire the one you're talking about. What do you mean? Like, well, you know, a lot of podcasts, you know, that's the thing, like, Podcasts seem like they're audio culture. I sound like a maniac, but often they're kind of textual in that A, they're edited and presented, and there's usually an agenda. And then two, there's a transcription. People can actually just read the podcast. Oh, I, we do transcriptions of our podcasts. Uh, I think we're a little behind, but just for the deaf community. And oh. so we try to keep up on that so that people oh. who, and it's just whatever. And then with the dumpster fire, I mean, the thing is, is people will also just do it for you. You know, you so, like you can get a transcription yeah. because you have like crazy people who will do that. Dumpster fire, no, we don't do that yet. It's a, like dumpster fire, and dumpster fire should be a podcast as well. We just haven't had the time, the bandwidth to like take the audio and upload it. It's right. really. Because it was such a visual medium for me, just me being performing, that I'm like, you lose so much, and we make so many jokes, and we use text a lot, where we'll editorial, because I can't fact check myself, so we'll fact check me afterwards, and I'm often getting things wrong, or saying the wrong word, or the wrong date, and so then we make a joke about me being an idiot, usually, and it's a a visual joke, which you would totally... put captions underneath? Yeah, we'll be like, she meant blah, 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 or whatever. Like, there's this kind of narrator function that we definitely use when we need to. And so I was like, that gets totally lost in audio, but it doesn't really matter. We don't use it so often that... So I'll do... We'll do a writer's room on the night before we do Dumpster Fire. Oh, you do? Okay. It's not like a fancy writer's room. Simmer down. It's just like three of us going through... We do the board on Trello. We gather all the stories, whatever I bookmarked on Twitter, whatever I commented on Twitter... I have one person who does research and catches stories and then anything we were texting each other in our group chat. Then we decide the order of the board. We put it in all our little categories on the Trello board. We rearrange it. Then we go through and write any kind of jokes. We just riff. And then then I just have my paper with the jokes we came up with. And then dumpster fire, really, we always joke like dumpster fire happens to us. Because we'll have this joke and all this stuff, but then something will take, you know, we all come in in a mood we're shooting in my undisclosed location, so there's no AC. It's right. it's there's dogs. Two weeks ago there was like there's a helicopter. Outside. There's a big lemon tree. It, two weeks ago there was a helicopter flying around, so we had to take a break. So it's it's very uh, rugged and raw. So yeah, that's a it's a it feels totally different than this medium, which feels more um, like let's sit down and have lemonade and just talk like right. you would have a conversation with your friend. A lot of the time I use it to catch up with my friends. So you agree that it's different media that you're talking about. Like your previous thing is visual and though you would think it'd be more impromptu is actually super engineered and scripted, but this is more unscripted. And it's just cool. Okay. Yeah. They're yeah. they're yeah. weird like that. Yeah, because a lot of people dig club is like, oh it's just pockets like, no. I <laughs> like 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 most podcasts are not as kind of unscripted as they seem. You know, oh kind of yeah, yeah. And, well, like, you know, you're saying so. Interesting. Well, I think I learned, I, I think, too, I just really, 
because I love Rogan's style of, I, it's just more me to just sit down and have a conversation and see how it goes and just shoot the shit. And some things will come up and some things won't. Some people will come on for one specific thing. And that is cool. You know, someone's like, I like how you're having these more pointed discussions about topics, but that's off. Like, publishers reach out to me all the time because my audience buys books, and now they know. So they'll they'll be like, hey, here's – and if I'm interested in the book, I'm like, hell yeah, have them come through. And wow. it's a good reason for me to read books. And so well, in that – You have a very nice bookshelf behind me. Thank with, you. Uh, recent volume, a lot of stuff, good stuff, actually. We And so I'll have – those are all the people whose, like, podcast book is down there I need yeah. to read. And it's it's definitely – so there's that aspect of it, and then there's just having my friends, and I have so many friends who are comedians, I love those conversations, are just very rambling and fun. So I think it's, every guest is different on here, you know, I, I want the guests to really inform the show more than me trying to, like, have some agenda and drive what it's like, what it feels like. Yeah, the Rogan thing is interesting because these podcasts are like three and a half hours long. And people love them. And they love them. It's funny. And, and you know, I don't actually, I, I've, I'm starting to do a bunch of podcasts. I'm actually um, talking to, nothing's firm yet, but it's probably going to happen. Matt TV maybe, uh, or not to do a podcast or something. Together? And potentially, yeah. He's coming on on Monday. Oh, is he? Is he? Yeah. Okay, cool. Interesting. Yeah, so, and it's funny because I actually don't listen to that many podcasts. I, I'm really much more of a visual and textual person. I only listen to podcasts with when I'm driving. But I agree, they have a unique reach, and they have, they have a feeling that you know the person. It's funny, I don't listen to as many as I should, just because when I do have free time, all I want to do is listen to music. So my all my audio time is devoted to my insane addiction to music. And I definitely love the medium in terms of... That's what's so wild. So we have this generation that's like, no attention span and yet my nephew who's 17 he loves rogan and like these are the kids who have no attention span but they're also the kids who will listen to three hours of rogan so there's a weird disconnect in terms of attention span and i'm that's what that's like the thing that i've been trying to get my mind around is what is the what is the is there an actual attention span deficit or is it do they do they do it 100 percent because he just sit there for three hours and listen to what he's doing something else I think most people are doing something else and they're it. listening to podcasts. That's it. I mean, I think mo- I mean, I think almost everyone I know listens to podcasts when they're cooking or cleaning or driving oh. or working out or they're not just like sitting focusing on the podcast. I know. I, I used to listen to podcasts when I would split wood when I was up in the Northwest, and I know it sounds ridiculously little hops in the parish, but <laughs> if you're heating your house with a wood stove and there's like nothing yeah, else, yeah, you got to like you got to you got to split wood yep. a lot. Yeah. And so I would probably, and then also if you had woods to maintain, you'd like down trees and buck them yep. and split them, and it's just part. Of, I didn't realize when you bought woods that you became like a lumberjack. So I became a lumberjack. <laughs> and I would just yeah, I would listen. I would listen to Carl Swisher's podcast a lot back in the day. And um, yeah, like an hour of splitting wood and listening to various podcasts, and now like, I almost need to do that. Yeah, I I think it's background for a lot of people. Yeah, it's background. Totally. But I have I have a really hard time focusing. I think it also depends on what kind of learner you are, right. or some. So I have I can't like books on tape. I do the same thing with movies. I can't really miss something that someone says. I will have to like rewind yeah, it. I don't want to thing. fill in the yeah, blank. Exactly. Yeah. And when I'm listening to a book on tape, for instance, and walking my dog, if my dog like jerks at a dog, and now I have to rewind it, and yeah. I can just read much faster than it takes me to actually listen to exactly. a book on tape. Yeah. And the same thing happens with podcasts where people will listen to it in the background and they'll get bits and pieces and they're fine with that and I, I can't do that. Yeah. I need to listen to like every word. Yeah, I'm the guy who, <laughs> if you showed up like four minutes late to the movie, I'm just like, I can't watch yeah. it. I missed these critical four minutes. I just, who knows? I don't know what's going on anymore. This right? is this, this should be a study because I think it is a personality <laughs> type because my husband's like, like he'll say something to me when we're watching something and then I'm like, now he has to rewind it and yeah. he's like, you can kind of guess what they said. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is the other weird thing too the rise of everybody watches shows and everything now not just because I think they're all going deaf and sound but they have the subtitles on yeah. almost all the time it feels like everybody really? does this yeah huh. yeah this is I. it feels like more I feel like I read something recently about how this is like a new uh, I don't know if it's I don't know why 
I don't know if it's interesting. You know, I I'm going. I'm just it. so fascinated with media in general. I can yes. talk about this stuff all. I think so yeah. much about it. So am I. It's nuts that we're living in the world of the spectacle. Yeah, the subtitle thing is interesting. I I've, I'm a total Israeli TV bender because I'm traveling to Israel, and as you can tell, I'm involved in this weird Jewish conversion process going on. I'm wearing a little kippah for those who aren't uh, watching. I guess there's no camera, but it is interesting that the uh, the subtitle thing. I'm quite proud about that. If you think people are just watching the subtitles all the time. Yeah, and they have a volume on, but a lot of the times I, I'll miss some of the something that they said, but I, I'll catch it because of the subtitles. So huh. I won't miss it, and then I won't have to rewind it because I won't be like, what they what did they say? Or I also wonder too if it's because people are also kind of scrolling while they're watching. That's what I think. That's exactly. I think it's a it's interesting. It's a it's a melding of the textual and the oral media in a way that people are just doing both at once in a way. Mm-hmm. Right? Or, or people like you and me are right because we spend our entire day staring at a screen. Staring at pixels isn't that just crazy? Just... I don't spend that much time really? staring at. I, I've been way better. I go and maybe it's just a phase, but I've been so. There was a really great thing on Twitter that I saw yesterday, and I retweeted it. And it was a woman who said, "Pretty crazy that none of this would have happened without Twitter." And it was a picture of her responding, someone responding to something that she tweeted, and then her DMing him and saying, like, I would, I'm just going to be honest, I would totally marry you. And he was like, that would be cool. <laughs> then they got married, and the final picture was her having their baby. Jesus Christ. So she was, it was her, like, four, you know, picture story of how they met on Twitter, basically. That because, child's existence is due to a tweet. Yeah. A tweet about, like, who keeps goats in their house or something. There's some weird tweet about goats. And... My friend was like, this is why I stay here, because I would be really cynical, and this place can be very beautiful, and it has connected me to so many people that are friends in my life and have become friends in real life and and are good friends. And I try not to throw the baby out with the bathwater, but it does feel like, maybe it just feels like the Overton window is closing me, and that there's just not, I don't feel like there's a space for me in Twitter. Because, really? because it's so binary. I just feel like if I'm not in either one, I'm tired of being like piled on by all sides. It's exhausting. I don't you get even, piled on a lot? I don't really see it that often, but I just, I just don't, I don't know that there's a space. Like maybe that's not the best medium for me anymore, even though I love it. I love, I love, I think it, it's fun when it's fun, but. What would be better, more visual or audio medium? Like, Maybe just, I mean, I don't know. Or just different I, people. Is the mechanism fine? It's just the people on it that you don't know. No, I just, I don't know that it's something changed about it. Something changed about the algorithm or something. I don't see anyone's tweets anymore that I follow. It's just, it's definitely yeah. feels... Maybe you should block more. Because I, I block like crazy now. In fact, I wrote a post about like the virtue of blocking. Create a block wall and just forget about whole parts of the world. And I'd say, even with this whole Apple thing, I really didn't see that much negativity, like, specifically. Like, if I searched for my name and, like, went to other threads, maybe. But me specifically, not really. I, it's not the, it's not the negativity, even. It's more what I feel like it's encouraging in the conversation. It just seems like you said it's bringing out the worst in, in people and in the conversation, and I don't know, I don't really know how to, there's no part of me being on Twitter that's going to make that better. It's incentivized to bring out the worst in us, even when they're like, we're going to fix this, and now you can't, you can only reply to some people, and I'm like, so you just encourage everyone dunking on everyone with quote tweets? Like, it seems crazy to me. Well, Bridget, maybe it's not Twitter that's going insane. Maybe the whole world is just gone crazy, and we need to create a different nation state or a different decentralized entity. Feels very strange, like strange times to me in general. How do you think this ends, Bridget? How, what, Thirty years from now, what, what is going to look like? Is it going to be more of the same? Is there going to be an actual secession, like a Cold War? Is some other crisis going to happen? I, I mean, I control. feel like that's what's been upsetting to me is that it seems as if there's a virtual civil war going on, and it just hasn't spilled out into the streets in a major way. We see little pockets of it, like scuffles in cities like Portland, and you'll see these extreme ends of this this conversation getting in fights, and I think most people want out of it, but it does seem as that, I mean, Jonah Goldberg always says it, like, this is your brain on tribalism, it's just, or maybe he doesn't say that, he, sa- he says something like, 
um, don't do tribalism, but it, I have been just looking at how, like you said, people can't, nothing rises to the level of getting any attention if it's not processed through the tribal brain. Right. And so, and it, it's increasingly harder for me to even have conversations with anyone who's in that tribal process because it's not even worth it. But we've always we've always had a tribal brain, right? Like in some sense, of course, the, the past forty fifty years of media have been the exception, not, not the rule. Right. But I think that's what Jonah says in his book about the uh, suicide of the left. Yeah, he oh. talks about how we stumbled into this miracle, and we somehow like overcame our our very very basic instincts, and then now it's it seems to be taking over again. Yeah, no, I mean, I've often thought that. I read a lot in Wired about how, like, this, the new media, the new journalism, which is, like, let's face it, pamphleteering. Journalism. Right, which is pamphleteering, and I don't mean that necessarily in a negative way. I mean, Ben Franklin was a pamphleteer. Sam Adams, who was actually a newspaper publisher in addition to being a brewer, was also a pamphleteer. But that, you know, that's that's the model of journalism as we've typically seen it. So in mm-hmm. some sense, we're not, we're just going back to the 19th century standard. That's yeah. That, that's that anyone who knows their history, you realize the 19th century wasn't exactly a polite time to live. It was right. kind of a very... Uh, Hard time to live, uh, where you had uh, a sitting vice president, Aaron Burr, shoot a former secretary of the treasury right. <laughs> in New Jersey and get away with it. Right. It's just like over over things that have been published. You know, there were all anon shit posters right. Right, that had been published. Um, I think it was Madison who had um, alleged that Burr's wife had been unfaithful or something right. uh, via one of his, you know, a troll, an anon account, basically. <laughs> they killed each other. And yeah. so, um, you know, we're returning to that world. but. The other side would be, this is the Bruno Machais theory. You know, his, his theory is that this is all LARP, right? This is all basically right. fantasy. Americans are actually, you know, just basically sublimating their hate for each other. There's, there's going to be no Fort Sumter shots fired in the Civil War. It's never going to happen. It's all going to happen on Twitter, and that's the end of it. You know, again, you know, is Twitter real life or not? That's, I think that's the real question. Well, that's my joke I always make, is America's too fat for a Civil War. Yeah, exactly. Nobody can actually <laughs> run a mile and shoot a rifle. We're like, actually super comfortable, too. So right. as much as everybody loves, like, and that's a weird thing thing of like outsourcing this outrage and I do agree a lot of it is just LARPing and maybe it's just blowing off steam yeah. maybe if people didn't have this outlet on Twitter they'd be like actually more fighting in the streets but yeah. I don't know that anybody would really know that much about any of this either Right. I mean, it's surprising how relatively little has spilled into the street, given how heated it seems to feel, right? Like, sure, you've got the Proud Boys, all 15 of them. Um, you know, <laughs> That said, when Twitter like, look at, I'm always, you know Francis Suarez, the mayor of Miami, basically tweeted Miami onto the tech map. I don't know how much you've seen of this, but a lot of tech people move there, and it's kind of a thing. Like, it's not the new San Francisco or anything, but it's definitely gonna, it's definitely another stop on the sort of train for tech in a way that it wasn't before. And he just he just tweeted into existence. At some point, Twitter does become reality. No, I say this all the time. I'm like, Twitter, it's not representative, but it's influential. Right. And it is like a little think tank where everybody's writing literally think pieces, and they're... And they're duking it out, and I'll say something. My example I always use is, for instance, you'll see like a gay character in a Marvel movie. The average person will be like, oh, that's weird anyway. They won't know that that appeared because the director got called out for not representing, right. and there was a whole thing on Twitter, and then someone got canceled, and now that it's like it still influences the culture at large. Yeah, it almost reminds me there was this uh, there's this notion in like uh, European intellectual history what was called the Republic of Letters which was sort of a historian would probably date this better than I would from you know call it the end of the Middle Ages like Renaissance up until modernity from like the 15th to the 18th century that was people like you know Kant having a conversation with I forget who the PSP or maybe Descartes or something and it you know and it was obviously like a high level elite conversation it wasn't necessarily held in newspapers although occasionally they would write publicly but it was the, sort of this this backdrop to the intellectual culture of the time. And I'm sure downstream of it, things like the French Revolution would happen, right. that in some sense were the output of, you know, John Locke having a conversation with whoever else, Hume or whoever. I'm probably muddling who actually were the, the, the nodes in the graph talking to each other. But you would have this, you know, Twitter is kind of that republic of letters, that things happen, elites talk to each other, weird shit spins off from that and has impact on the culture. And people downstream of that maybe didn't even know the initial tweet that started it. Yeah, no. Yeah. It just becomes part of... I mean, I think we saw that with things like CRT, right. you know, where it, it, that's like everything gets flattened. So people were having this conversation about cancel culture, and then the minute I see it on Fox, I'm like, oh, shit, it's gone mainstream. <laughs> you know, it gets, yeah, so it's what, hit the mainstream. Yeah, so it, it it's obviously, hit the boomers. Right, it, right. It start, when the boomers start repeating stuff, I'm like, oh, shit. 
Right, so it starts in Twitter, it goes to Substack, it'll hit Vox and BuzzFeed, Reddit, then it'll, it'll, Reddit for sure, Reddit's New York really Times early. and New York Magazine, and then Fox will have like the reaction to it, <laughs> and then that, that's that's the full epistemological chain. And then you end up, <laughs> and then it's on to the next one like three weeks later. And that's this it. is that freaking book that I talk about every single person I have who comes on and talks about media, mediated. I'm oh, like, it's a great book. I love that. Yeah. No one else has read it. I, I know it's funny. You're I was, the only person I I talked to. I mentioned this book. I'm interviewing him. I, I oh really? Finally, oh, cool. but that guy called it 2006. Yes. yes. When that book came out, I was like, I have to get this, and I read it, and I did not fully understand postmodernism even then because I just didn't I didn't go to college. I didn't know what it was. I understood a lot of what he was talking about in terms of the self representational and reflexive nature of media and right. this was like pre-social media that yeah. i've been begging him to write another follow-up book to this yeah so in case people don't know who that is because I, I it's funny i name dropped his book in uh marshall Koslov's the realignment podcast this week as well and it's Thomas thomas, thomas de Zenko, yeah it's, th- there's, it's really hard to pronounce Zenko Tisha. Like, it's, Zenko Tisha. it's called mediated and it's kind of overlooked i mean you can still find it i mean it's still in print or at least you can buy the used versions of it but he totally caused called much what we're talking All about of it it's There's hard. a fucking chapter called Identity Politics right, right. in his book. Yeah, yeah. And the the key thing, one of the scenes in the book that I find, well, there's two scenes in the book that I find most striking. He opens it. The opening. He, the opening with the JFK assassination yeah. thing, which there's a lot of setup there. I don't know if this actually could translate in a podcast setup, but the, so I guess he was on like an Strasbourg style method acting class mm-hmm. in which, for those who aren't familiar with this school of acting, um, you know, it's like it's method acting. It's method acting. You're supposed to actually experience the emotions rather than the sort of Shakespearean distance or whatever. And so, like, if if and there's an exercise where, like, oh, you find out your mother just died, and you're supposed to feel the feeling of pathos or whatever. So anyhow, it's like it's like whatever it is, November twenty second, nineteen sixty three, <laughs> and someone walks into the door and says. JFK has been shot. This this story is horrifying. I know. And then everyone starts acting as if the president had gotten shot. They're like, oh, this is the drill. This is the drill. Yeah. Like, we're here for this. Like, it happened to be time, like, right when the class started. Everyone emotes for 20 minutes. And then someone walks in and says, like, no, no. In, in reality, like, the president actually got shot. Like, that's what's happening right here. Here's the TV. And then... Like literally, he said he ran out the room. He just yeah, couldn't, he, he, couldn't just, handle it. he couldn't handle it. He never went back to acting. He never went back to the class. <laughs> just over. Like, how can you have? And the the key reason why he raised that is like there's this question in society, and again, like Gen Z is like not even understand what we're talking about. But it used to be among boomers, like where were you when JF when you learned that right. JFK was shot? Like, when did you have the collective media phenomenon right. of this? phenomenon at a distance that didn't directly impact you you weren't there but you had a collective feeling of it happening to you and if you contrast that to like the greatest generation like right. where were you when you heard about pearl harbor it wasn't a question anybody asked because there was no image to share it wasn't a collective media phenomenon right it's like you, you maybe read about it certainly it, it impacted your life but it wasn't you didn't feel as if it had happened in a real direct way and it was that point in which the culture switched and you know, distant phenomenon that really aren't related to you suddenly became figures in your life. And the same way that Twitter, like, will make your heart rate shoot up. And you're, you've mediated life. Reality, what you experience, has now been catered to you. The other right. story that he has in that I really remember is that he mentions like his car breaking down in Saskatchewan, yeah. Canada, or something, yeah. middle of nowhere, and the car just breaks down, and, and you're stuck, mediated. And, and nothing's mediated. Like. You know, you've got like a tumbleweed going by. There's like a burden. You realize the, your entire setting is no longer engineered to please and interface with you. It's just yeah. like, and there's this feeling of just enemy and disconnect. It's like, oh my god, what is going on? And so, anyhow, it's a great book. It's so I read it's it so every good. year. Yeah. And it, it's a, like this is so exciting for me to nerd out about this book. The other thing that really stuck out for me is the Princess Di anecdote, where he talks about this was right after kind of the dawn of that switch and the 24-hour news cycle right. and how everyone knew their role. Everybody knew right. like what role they were supposed right. to play in this global right. you know, expression of grief and the and the mourners with their flowers right. and it I think about this book every day. All right. every day. Just the whole how he breaks down um, you know, real, like real, real, there's real I need to reread it. I, it's so good. Yeah. I, I, it's, I think it's right behind you. Oh, is it? Let's see. Uh, yeah, it's right behind you. I'm next sitting to in the, front of uh, Bridges. It's next to oh, the Joseph Campbell one. Oh, there you go. Oh, it's like destroyed. That one in Trickster Makes This World, I read them for pretty much every year. But yeah, he just absolutely nailed it. Just nailed it. Fascinating. Yeah, and he's like a PhD in anthropology. It's interesting. He's, in a- he's just so... I, I, I remember reading that book on a beach 
and being like, oh my God, I'm reading the future. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? it's a mind blowing book. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and he keep, he's such a great writer. Yeah. It's yeah, actually yeah. entertaining in the way he, and the whole, the other one that I always think about is um, Justin's Helmet Principle. The whole idea oh. of if your kid can be safer, why wouldn't you make your kid safer? <laughs> Uh, you know, we didn't, like, he was talking about how they didn't have to wear helmets, but then they found out that all these kids are getting brain, and you don't want to be the parent that doesn't make right. your kid wear a helmet, because that would be horrible if something happened to your kid, but then now, kind of fast-forwarding into the coddling of the American mind, yeah. it's fascinating. Yeah, this triumph of safetyism is another thing that I can't, can't quite remember. I, I did a post about, like, in my Miami childhood, which I use it as a reference point of, A, pre-internet era, and B, living inside a weird little ethnic tribe, which... Mm you know, is com considerably at variance with the modern discourse around white privilege and all this stuff. And so I was just, one of the footnotes was like, and you remember this, right? Like the amount of stuff, shit that you could get away with in the pre-smartphone era as a kid, or as just like anybody, like the shit that we would do and just like think, well, like if no one literally dies or goes to the hospital, nobody gets arrested, then like, whatever, it didn't happen. Who cares? Mm -hmm. It just doesn't matter. Like whatever, right? There used to be this thing in Miami, people don't really do it anymore. Who knows? Maybe they do. But they used to fire guns in the air, like, you know, Afghan tribesmen or something. <laughs> On New Year's, 12 shots in the air, you know, obviously barbarous custom, kind of fun. And, you know, I remember doing this as a kid, like holding up a Glock and firing 12 rounds in the air and then drinking cedar with my parents and eating 12 grapes. I'm just like, oh, well, whatever. So it's cool. Like now, like nobody could get away with doing no. that. No. Or like drag racing in high school or dating or getting drugs. All this random shit that would just never follow you. It's like a moment happened. You had a formative experience around it and that's it. It's gone. There's just your average person didn't, you know, wasn't a celebrity that lived kind of in the eye of the camera all the time. I think everyone's internalized in some sense being a celebrity and it's like, I, I, I think I said this in Cast Monkeys, right? Like the famous Andy Warhol quote, like in the future, everyone's going to be famous for 15 minutes. That's totally wrong. Everyone's going to be famous 24 seven to 15 people, right? That's right. that's really what it is. And so to, to live your life like a celebrity without the countervailing things like wealth or whatever is, uh, is strange. And well, it's just, that's mediated. Yeah. I mean, that, it yeah. is like, what? who are we on the... He, I, that's why that book was so mind-blowing to me. I was like, this is the first guy who's taken a step back and said, whoa, whoa, whoa. How is this affecting us? Like the how we started this conversation. How is this affecting us just on a fundamental level as human beings? Yeah. It's obviously rewiring our brains. Yeah, and then and people like you, I don't know if you, if you saw Caitlin Flanagan had a piece about like her quitting Twitter. She quit Twitter for yeah, 20 days. Yeah, I've written so many, I've done this before with Twitter. Yeah, yeah, and it's, it's. I mean, she's correct in that it totally, if you're living life in the spotlight, like you try to recycle everything in your daily life for the spectrum. Again, you feel that mediated feeling. And it's interesting. Yeah, it's so it's a strange way to look. I had this moment last night. My cousins read this book, and she's a producer on this too. She does the editing, and we were doing this. Like I started making jokes, and she was, and we were just in the moment, and it was really funny. And then she's like, "Oh, we should record you see? <laughs> doing uh, this for see? content," and I'm like, "It's mediated." It it just you can't you can't help it. I mean, that's also being a comedian. So yes. there's I'm doubly. Like, comedianism is a thing, too, I think, that should have a 12-step program. No, I agree, because that, that's that used to piss me off about comedians, because they always try to be funny. You know when you're in the presence of a comedian, because they're always trying to, like, get the spotlight and tell the joke. And if they're funny, obviously, it's great, but if not, it's not. Or great. it's always looking for, so I had to, oh, to open up about my moment of shame. So I'll, <laughs> we'll circle back completely, and then okay. we'll, we can wrap it up. I... I had this moment yesterday, I was like wondering what it was all for because of this existential crisis we just spent an hour talking about. And like, what am I doing? None of this is real. Do I even matter? Why do I think I matter? I hate all of this. I hate everyone. I hate myself. Um, Jesus, <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, you, I have those moments. I'm also an alcoholic, so it's just like goes with the territory. But I was having this kind of moment. Okay. I generally only have them in really bad traffic, but I was having this <laughs> existential... You have like a falling down moment. Like every, movie. Yeah. every time. I was in traffic the other night going to Glendale for something, and it was the first time I'd been in traffic in a while in L.A. And you I'm were like, on the 10 at rush hour. What the fuck am I... Well, 405. The 405. What the fuck am I doing with my life? And I'm oh like, God, this is so sad. And so <laughs> I, was, I was on deadline for my column, and I'm like, what am I even fucking writing about? And uh, who cares about any of it? And my column is about, can you be liberal and love America? That's like the, that was the topic I was thinking about. And then I was thinking about how the New York Times wrote that piece, they, they had that thing that went viral on Twitter. They tweeted about how some think opinion piece they posted 
that was about like the American flag brings up a lot yes. and it can be divisive or whatever. Right. The American and, flag. Is yeah, divisive. the American flag is divisive, and I and so I, I ended up on Fox, and then there was a video. <laughs> Because I was looking for something where I couldn't, I'm not going to pay for the New York Times, so I'm like, who's going to give some synopsis of this? And then I start watching this video, and it's a, a V, a V shred ad. This fucking douchebag who, it's, my, this is my moment of shame. Uh oh, okay. It's a video where he's talking, he's like, are you an, a like woman who's just been battling with like going on diets and you're not happy with your body? And I swear to God, I watched a whole 30 minute basically infomercial from this fucking douchebag and then bought <laughs> the V-Shred. What is the V-Shred? It's like a freaking, it's an app and it's like a diet plan and just, it's fucking stupid. That was your moment of shame. You oh God, I'm pit. still feel, and now, so then, then, you get, so I was talking to my therapist about this and she's like, I swear to God, Bridget, you're my funniest client. Cause I'm like, now I'm in this hateful shame loop that I can't get out of <laughs> because they kept sending me emails after I signed up, which I already felt ashamed about. <laughs> <laughs> and they said, and they're like, "Hey, have you tried the supplements? You got to try the supplements, <laughs> supplements, supplements." And I'm, and so I email back to one of their emails. They're like, "I'm like, if you send me one more cell about supplements, I'm gonna cancel this plan before I even start it." And then it's an auto generated email. It comes back and it's a coupon for supplements. <laughs> supplements from now on it's just supplements all the way down i seriously was like i'm gonna kill myself <laughs> i was, i was just like this is rock bottom b shred is rock b -shred bottom, is rock bottom. <laughs> what rock bottom is b shred and it's just it's just like this the, you do daily workouts it was like 90 days to shred i would never i don't know i don't know what was going on with me but and it was like a 30 minute video. I don't have attention span for this shit. I can't even handle it. I don't know what this, was this an AI generated in a lab to like speak directly to every. But you bought it. You bought the food blender. You bought the. I the, bought it. Yeah. It's so embarrassing. I mean, and then of course I was talking to my therapist about it, trying to explain what happened and she's laughing and I'm like, I should turn this into a stand up routine. It's like mediated. Yes. Being a comedian, you're already mediating everything right. that's what I mean about it's doubly bad when you're a com comedian because now you, as a comedian you're walking through the world and everything was there was always this narrator in my brain before I even knew I was a comedian that was like making fun of everything ah, it was there to begin with okay there to begin with my mom sent me to this stupid thing it was like healing your aloneness workshop <laughs> I have these moments where it's just like the writer, and maybe it's just a function of being a writer, where the, the, there's someone who's narrating, I'm like, this is the dumbest shit, and we were holding hands at the end, and I couldn't stop laughing, I was laughing so hard, I was, I had tears rolling down my cheeks, and then my, they thought I was crying, because I was moved, and then they realized I was laughing, and they like threw my hand away, and they were so mad, it was so, my aloneness was not healed that day. But I think it's a common thing. Like I have lived life in this weird writerly dissociation in which like if I were to write this in an essay, like any given moment, like literally any, even the most mundane thing, like standing in line winning the Trader Joe's and just some like weird guy with like a bizarre Hawaiian shirt who has nothing but like, you know, Easter Bunny Joy chocolates and, and, acid, and, and, right, well, and six crates of like, you know, you know, two buck chuck or whatever it is or something, just some bizarre, like who the hell is this guy, what's going on? Like there's always that voice in my head. Always. Yeah. I do think it's a function of being a writer. So I, that's what got me thinking when I was reading that book. I'm like, well, writers are already subject to this. Like right. as a writer, you're already mediating your whole right. life. That's right. And then now it's like on fire. For me, it's like throwing gasoline on fire. Right. And sometimes I just think, I, I seriously can't believe it. I can't believe I even admitted it publicly, but I should probably, I should probably let it go. My V shred. <laughs> <laughs> So embarrassing. If you saw this guy, you would find And now you've cry. plugged it. It's incredible. You, no, you know, I know. You, you totally plugged it. I didn't mean to. Maybe um, you pay for podcast ads. Well, you don't oh, my God. Look at this fucking like douchebag. Hold on. Shred. Oh, I like the logo. Look at that. Yeah. No. Oh, look. Six-pack shred. Oh, look. My You're custom gonna get toned diet plan is here. You're gonna toned get... in 90 days. Wow. <laughs> and it's just exercise. And then you just po po put on day one, and this is the fucking dude. <laughs>
What's going on, ladies? Welcome to your Monday workout. That means We're Taylor. He knows I'm a lady. Body and Ab is gonna be wow. about an 18 minute it looks workout. pretty shredded. We got a bunch of exercises. This fucking dude. I watched a half an hour. It was like 45 minutes. <laughs> This is also the function of procrastination. Right. And you were under deadline. deadline. You yeah. de exactly. Okay. I'm at my weakest. You yeah. can sell me anything on deadline. <laughs> <laughs> the, the, the algorithm's probably figured out. If your deadline's on Friday, they know to hit you with it on Thursday or Friday. <laughs> some girl. Some girl. I was at, like on Twitter yesterday, and some, I've had my I've opened up my DMs for some reason, and then I just left them open. I'm like, whatever. And this girl was like, hey, I need your advice. And I was like, perfect. I've got all the time in the world. What do you need? I'm like, you caught me at a good time. She's like, oh, cool. I'm like, I'm on deadline. <laughs> this is when I will organize my spices alphabetically. <laughs> no, the other thing I did was I decided that it was the perfect time to figure out where my gas main was <laughs> in case of an earthquake so oh. that I could turn it off. Ah. And I spent an hour ah. finding the right tool. <laughs> Did you find it? Well, we ordered one and it didn't work, and okay. so then I had to find another tool. But now, yeah, I, I think I've got I think I've got it <laughs> dialed in. I'm keeping the tool in case my neighbors need help. <laughs> psycho. <laughs> I'm a psycho. But anyway, this has been really fun. Thank you, Bridget. Yes, and it has been fun. I yeah. hope everyone. Okay, so where can we find you? And oh. your Substack. Plug all right. your stuff. Sure. Twitter <laughs> You're like, at... gonna be on V Shred. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. V Shred. I'm gonna shred it abs in ninety days. <laughs> or bust. Um, the uh, on Twitter at Antonio GM or the pull request .com, um, is the Substack. And uh, yeah, that's what I'm doing now. And I write about uh, sometimes more geeky stuff like ads and privacy and data, which I've been doing for various companies for ten to fifteen years. Most recently at Apple, before that at Facebook and other companies. The algorithm is so smart. The alg sort of, sort of, sort of. It's not as smart as people say, but it, sure. It knows me. Go cool. follow as Substack, everyone. I'd like to take a quick break so we can talk about our sponsor. Walk-Ins Welcome is brought to you by Progressive. Progressive helps you get a great rate on car insurance, even if it's not with them. They have this nifty comparison tool that puts rates side by side so you choose a rate and coverages that work for you. So let's say you're interested in lowering your rate on your car insurance. Visit Progressive.com to get a quote with all the coverages you want. You'll see Progressive's rate and then their tool will provide options from other companies all lined up and easy to compare so that all you have to do is choose the rate and coverages you like. Progressive gives you options so you can make the best choice for you. You could be looking forward to saving money in the very near future. More money for, say, a pair of noise-canceling headphones, an Instapot, more puzzles, whatever brings you joy. Get a quote today at Progressive.com. It's one small step you can do today that could make a big impact on your budget tomorrow. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and Affiliates. Comparison rates not available in all states or situations. Prices vary based on how you buy. Oh, shoot. I have to ask you my two questions I ask everyone. Oh, okay. Oh, dear. What is your biggest defect of character or vice? You can, you can interpret that. God, I have so many. I have to pick my favorite. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> <laughs> if, it, if you ask me what my virtues, I, there's, there's, there's a smaller number to choose amongst. That's the next question. <laughs> oh, is it? Um, I like to end on a high note. And, of course, what people in my life would answer it may not be what I would answer to this question. Certainly my exes would probably answer different questions. What is my biggest vice in the, of the traditional like Christian vices? Like, no, so. it can be like I it, you can in, or defective characters. A lot of people are like, oh, that's like therapy or twelve. So you can honestly interpret it. It can be what you're trying uh, to better yourself today. It can be something that plagues you your whole life. Yeah, I think. Well, let's let me just be Christian about it and frame it in terms of the Christian vices. At least it frames it a little bit. Um, one of those would be gluttony. Not that I eat that much, although certainly I could probably. Do eat. I have a program? For you? Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> 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 But it's gluttony as regards to everything. Like everything I do, I tend to do completely over the top in an mm. excessive way that's just completely life wrecking. And I think I'm just slowing down because I'm getting older and like you just can't be on that train for much longer. But even now, I'm still kind of on it. And so I think that over excessive investment in everything and then, it, you know, anger a little bit, but not, that's a little bit less than it used to be. And then is the next one virtues? Yeah. Uh, Your biggest uh, asset. It shouldn't be, it shouldn't be this hard for me to think of one. Um, 
Well, I mean, it's it's a flip side of the same thing. This sounds like a ridiculous job interview question. It's like, oh, what's your biggest? What's your biggest? Uh, like, I'm that, just I, too I just, I just, well, I just work too hard. <laughs> I, I just, just care. I too just much. take. I just care too. I take my job too seriously. <laughs> but um, yeah, the obsession. When I think back, like you know, I don't think I'm really smart. I certainly didn't come from a privileged or name brand background. What's the only thing that set me apart, or even landed in these spots at these companies or these places? It was really the obsessive focus and the willingness mm. to stop at nothing to get there, which I think was life wrecking in other regards, and I actually regret it in many ways. And I think. I, you could, I could have gotten there without the same level of like personal destruction along the way. But that, you know, without any doubt, that was definitely part of it. Nice. Yeah. I love that. Well, yeah. thank you for coming by. Yeah, thank you this for was just, really fun. Always and fun chatting. And I love that. Yeah, you can come by anytime. Sure. And now I finally met someone who's also read Mediated and my yes. whole day is made. <laughs> it's time for the weekly check-in with Bridget and Cousin Maggie. Well, let's talk about other people being stupid for once, Maggie. <laughs> Instead of us, it's just so ugly. The whole culture war thing is so stupid. I hate it so much. Both parties are dead to me. <laughs> dead to me now. I'm just so over like the the vaccine thing makes me want to like claw my fucking eyes out. Yeah. Just the fighting about it and the the way people talk about it and the way people talk to people who are hesitant about it. Like, oh, you fucking idiots. Like, yeah. I don't blame people for not wanting to get it. I don't blame them. It, it, it is like testing. Yeah, we're fucking guinea pigs. Uh-huh. I didn't get my period for three months. That could be because maybe I have menopause, but now I'm finding out that maybe that's not true and I have to get tested. My levels have to get tested again. Wow. Because now I'm just back on a cycle. Weird. My sister... She's late after the vaccine. Like, we don't know. We don't freaking know. Yeah. And because they didn't even think to study how COVID affected women, because women are still a second class citizen in the world, <laughs> they have no idea how the vaccine affects them. Yeah. It's so annoying. Patriarchy is truly very crafty. So yeah, I don't I don't blame people. And then when you start banning people for even talking about it. And even having questions and even having discussions about it. And then you start like it's not making any of this no, better. That's ter- <laughs> like that's the terrifying part is like you're not allowed to have debate and question and like be like, well, I, I have hesitations because of these things, whatever. I mean, I think there's a big difference between people who think that it's going to like put a microchip in them and <laughs> have 5G bats attracted to them. <laughs> Yes. And people who have legitimate concerns about what the side effects are because we really have no way of knowing. Uh-huh. So I feel like there are shades of, you know, there are there's shades, shades of, of hesitancy. Yes. And there's and then there's just like plain old, you know, old fashioned anti-vaxxers, which are also exist on both sides. Uh-huh. So, yeah, you've got a whole shit show going on. And it's funny to me that people are like, well, back in the good old days, everyone just would have been on board. I'm like, well, I don't know that that's great. Back in the good old days, there were no vaccines. <laughs> if you read the whole like history of the polio vaccine, there were like 56 kids that died in the first trial because of there were it was like the way they were storing it was bad and mm-hmm. there wasn't really any checks and balances. Mm-hmm. And people were so desperate to get the vaccine because polio is polio. Right. That they were, you know, they still lined up even after this happened. Right. And it was like a lot of kids got polio from this batch because they, I forget what the whole thing was, but a lot of people also, like 56 kids died or something like that. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine now if 56 kids died from this? It would be like... The end of the world. But polio is really freaking bad. Yeah, polio is horrible. The that's dogs what are I, going crazy. That's right what now. I hate about this um, virus, which is tragic and horrible and has killed a lot of people, and I don't want to minimize that. But it's not like your eyes are bleeding. It's not so bad that everyone can be united. It's like just bad enough. Right, right, that it's divisive. Yeah. The mortality rate isn't like gigantic. It's not it's like not, the 9-11 of viruses. It's not it can't like use... smallpox or polio or, you know, like the really, truly terrible. It can't like unite the country for a moment. <laughs> no, it can't. It can't. <laughs> it's just dividing us even more. It's almost like it was created in a lab. <laughs> <laughs> Specifically for this purpose. Oh, boy. Here we go. 
I have that's, so much stand up in me today. That's the bandwagon Bridget's jumping on. Yes. This was it's all a conspiracy. Shit. It was created as a form of control. Team Mitch McConnell was freaking going off the rails today about how if everybody doesn't get vaccinated, we're going to go back into lockdowns. It's like the government threatening to ground you. It's yeah. so stupid. They're like, if you don't eat your peas, we're going to lock you in your room. <laughs> Take away all of your fun times. You won't be able to see your friends. No one's having it. No, I don't know what's going on. Nothing is going on. It is literally psyops. That's what's going on. It feels like we are in a giant psychological like matrix. It is definitely even still in California going places since they put the mask mandate back in place. A lot of people still aren't wearing masks indoors. <laughs> and I'm kind of like, yep, everyone's just kind of like, no, fuck it. <laughs> yeah, they're over it. Or they can't remember or whatever. It's just so confusing. And that's not, again, to minimize the fact that hospitalizations are going up. Mm -hmm. The virus is very real. Mm -hmm. There's that great expression. There's that expression I read in an article about the Indian death toll, which is apparently like three million, Ugh, like so horrible. much worse than the reporting, which does not surprise me. There's a 1.3 billion people in India, so that's nothing. Mm -hmm. And I was reading about how they were like, you can't like coffins don't lie. Funeral pyres don't lie. You can't like you can believe whatever you want to believe, but like the number of yeah dead. cadavers don't lie well i was reading an article about the covid widows in india and how mm. like you know uh, actually they they were like we don't have exact numbers especially from certain regions about how many men versus women died but it seems like more men died and they were the main breadwinners of their family and a lot of their wives like they're leaving them with kids to support no means of like it's some a lot of the women are un, uneducated and can't read and so there's really it, this they're facing this kind of terrifying future of what do we new, do now yeah and they have no income I, all of a sudden i read an article about how like a million kids have been orphaned or lost one at least one parent wow. for, to covid and i think that's in the world which actually yeah. doesn't seem like that many but still a lot yeah and then there's like all these stories we didn't cover happening around us. I know. And the fucking fires and floods. The fires, the floods, the just uh, uh, the droughts, the I mean we're living in the apocalypse. It's it's we're a slow building. In the apocalypse. Yeah, it's a slow burn, but it started. It has begun. And it's the 20th anniversary of 9/11 coming up, wow. which I can't stop thinking about for some reason because I can't believe it was 20 years ago. No, neither can I. It's crazy. I'm going to be in New York. Of course you are. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, if the shit's going down, I'm going to go see it. <laughs> if the shit's going down, no, it just feels like uh, weird that it's been 20 years. Definitely. Can't believe it. I remember sitting in that little freaking shoebox like it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. My nephew going down the slide for the first time as the towers came down. I'll never forget it. Mm -hmm. And then just like not being able to get off the couch. Well, the weird thing is, is too, I feel like when the first plane, after the first plane hit, you and your sister pulled out your, yeah, we your have video, video recorder. And we're like, we're recording this. And then, so you caught your reaction to the second plane. Hitting. Talk about mediated. Yeah. We were already videotaping because my nephew just was going down the slide for the first time. So right. we all, we were already videotaping everything, but then this was like an actual moment where he did something for the first time. Uh, I and see. so we already had it out and we were rolling. And then it like, it was, then it started unfolding and oh. we just kept it going. Yeah. Like the shock, that like real life shock. I still am like, how did that happen? I know. <laughs> like, how did it happen? That was the first moment that I thought maybe we're living in a simulation because it was so like just the way they came down even. I it was know. just so, it was like, you can't, I don't under, I still don't understand. And nothing's really ever, I mean, I had a client when I was teaching yoga and he was like, your generation's been fucked ever since 9-11. He was like, 9-11 fucked every generation behind it. No, it changed the world. It really did. It changed so many things. Yeah. I mean, my nephews don't know not being at war. Mm. They've been at war since they were born. Mm -hmm. 
Or they haven't been. <laughs> They've been at war like, on video games. Yeah. They haven't been like getting the droned country has in always another been country. <laughs> involved in a war. Yeah. It's very strange times. This has been a super uplifting check in. <laughs> hey, this is where we're at, I Maggie. Know. It is where we're this at. This is what the check in is. This is, this is the world today. This is a no bullshit, unfiltered check-in. <laughs> Two people just trying to make sense of it all. Sometimes there is no making sense of it. So I've been reading all these emails from people. I've been following up with my IamPoliticallyHomeless.com or my, my IamPoliticallyHomeless at gmail.com. Uh-huh. I had thousands of emails uh-huh. from people telling me how they became politically homeless. Right to left, left to right, right to center, left to center, anarchist to you know like radicalized right whatever all these people who are all over the place and i've been following up with a lot of them and saying how do you feel now you know post-election and post-pandemic i was asking these questions before even the pandemic right and every single response so far has been more hopeless (laughs) (laughs) yeah (laughs) it's <laughs> that's not an uplift that's probably why this check-in is kind of dark because i was reading all those responses and i was like oh so everyone's actually doing worse yeah you need to be careful with your consumption of those emails again. oh i went back down the so i went down the self-censorship email uh-huh. rabbit hole the other night because uh-huh. maggie basically made me stop reading them like two or three years ago because she was like huddled in a corner in a dark room and hadn't come out for like three days and had these dark circles under her eyes. I was like, this is not good for you. Like, you need to stop. She's like in a corner of the room. It was bad. A mattress yeah, you were floor. like, you looked like you were tweaking. It was, or, you know, some sort of I had like printed den. them all out and was like putting them in different piles. Maggie's like, okay, get out of this room. And it was really, I think that's why I feel so frustrated with like a lot of the people who are now in the sub sex space in particular, who are writing all these stories of like, here's a story of self censorship. I'm like, I fucking tried to tell you people all of these stories four years ago, not to mention pitch these stories and you didn't want to even hear it Mm. or weren't even allowed to publish it. But you were revisiting them. Yeah, they're bad. Yeah. I mean, this is why I'm so bored with that. I'm like, yeah, no shit. We're headed towards communism, but who cares? Like, it's too late. There just seems to be a slow cycle de- decline into chaos. Like, I just feel like we're disintegrating into chaos in so many different areas. What people don't understand is that chaos was always, and this was a reprieve from that. Yeah. And we happen to fall in the reprieve. Like the and it's going to be much harder for us than it was for most of humanity. Mm-hmm. Because they were used to just getting raped and pillaged all the time. <laughs> and <laughs> knew how to like grow their own food and, you know, s- s- be get, self-reliant. Hunt and gather and, you and know, make their like, own shit. Yeah, they weren't all out of shape because of the, you know, droughts and the plagues. Oh, man, we're so fucked. And we're just going to be, we're even more screwed because we're soft. We're soft. We're just a bunch of pussies. What is that phrase that I love? Good good times create soft people or something. There's some like kind of famous I don't know. expression that's like good times create soft people and hard times create hard people. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Look it up, Bridget. <laughs> I feel like Google is my friend right now. <laughs> So yeah, that's why I spend a lot of time just preparing for the apocalypse, but it's stupid anyway. It's also why we want to try, why we do try and focus on content that makes us laugh, that makes people laugh. That's all I can do. Or At the very least, that's all we can do. Yeah. Because on the other hand, things have never been better. Uh We have vaccines. Uh We have antibiotics. Uh We have all kinds of things that we... Never had water and food. And I try to stay focused on how we've actually never lived in the best time ever to be human. And that's still the case, even if it does feel like it might slip away in our lifetime. (laughs) We'll see how it goes. Oh, God. I was at the beach talking to somebody about like what happens if there's a 7.0 earthquake here. 
And this person just is a lawyer and very nonchalantly described like what would happen, you know, in the first wave. And then in the second week, it would be like the roving gangs shooting people for water and shit. And oh I was like, God. you know, what's really unsettling is this is entirely possible. <laughs> <laughs> Buy guns and ammo. <laughs> this is just going to be my refrain from now on. That's the running theme now. <laughs> That should be one of our dumpster vital fire titles. Yep. And then we'll get banned. Tune in next week for another riveting episode that will change your life, help you get out of your own way, and solve all the world's problems. I want to thank our composer, Jared Elias, my co-producer and cousin, Maggie, and all of you out there listening. This has been Walk-In's Welcome with Bridget Fettesy. I'm Bridget Fettesy, and you're welcome. <laughs> the dumbest line <laughs>